Chapter 3, My Work I will endeavor, in this chapter, to tell something about my works and whereabouts. I was ordained to the Gospel Ministry in 1867 by Rev. Mr. Slater, White, and Rev. Henry Bynum. Rev. Stevens Coleman and Rev. Henry Bynum, aided by Dr. Joseph Shackelford, White, laid down the foundation stones for the Colored Baptist Churches in Morgan, Franklin, Colbert, Lauderdale, and Lawrence Counties, Alabama. I am now pastor of the First Baptist Church, at Tuscumbia, Alabama, which is the best Negro edifice in North Alabama. This church was organized 35 years ago, by me, with 75 members, but it now had a membership of 900. I have pastored it for low. These many years. This church is an excellent brick edifice. A few other brethren and myself organized the Muscle Shoals Baptist Association, one of the oldest and largest associations in Alabama. I have been moderator for four years and its treasurer for six years. I built the church at Russellville, Alabama, and pastored it for four years, and then ordained Bro. Pete Jones and recommended him as pastor. I built the Barton Church and pastored it for a period of fifteen years, after which I recommended Rev. James Hampton there as pastor. I pastored the Cherokee Church five years, ordained Bro. Dennis Jackson and recommended him there as pastor. I pastored Liberty Baptist Church for three years, ordained bro, Alex Brown and recommended him there as pastor. I served Aoka, Mississippi for five years and then recommended a brother from the West, who belonged to the empty Olive Association, to it. I built up the Sheffield Church, pastored it three years and then recommended bro, G.B. Johnson there as shepherd. I also built up Empty Mariah Church at Prides, Alabama. I frequently uttered these words. Where Jesus leads me I will follow. And his footsteps I'll pursue. I organized St. Paul Church, Colbert County, and pastored it for two years. Rev. D.C. White, who is now assistant moderator of the Muscle Shoals Association, was ordained by me. I have ordained more than twenty preachers to the gospel ministry, baptized six thousand persons, united in marriage five thousand couples, and buried about seven thousand persons. I have been faithful to every charge. Hark the voice of Jesus calling. Who will and work today? Fields are white and harvest waiting. Who will bear the sheaves away? I have never left the old land mark. Not in one of the churches which I have pastored has brought a charge against me. The deepest secrets of our hearts shall shortly be made known. I have been married three times and have known no woman but my wife, though unlearned and ignorant. I have never had but one fuss with my wife. I told her at one time to hush and she failed to do so, then I slapped her, after which I went to the Lord in prayer and asked to be forgiven. I regret very much indeed to inform the world in print that I have been drunk from intoxicating liquors twice, which was before I professed religion. Notwithstanding I have ever held up temperance and aimed to keep it high until Shiloh comes to gather up his jewels. The following recommendation will show what the best people of Tuscumbia think of me. Tuscumbia, Alabama. March 13, 1897. To whom it may concern. We take pleasure in stating that we have known the bearer of this letter, Rev. Wilson Northcross for a number of years, and that he is a conscientious, intelligent colored man of good character. He has been pastor of the Missionary Baptist Church of this place since the war, having been instrumental in building the church, and always has made a good citizen. We believe him in every way worthy of the respect and confidence of his people. Fox Deloney, Judge of Probate. Jazz H. Simpson. Circuit Clerk. Chaz Simpson, Deputy Clerk. W. H. Sautel. Max Lueedman. The following resolution was adopted by the church which I pastored thirty years. Resolved, that Rev. W. E. Northcross, our pastor, is a good, moral, Christian man. He has been our pastor for thirty years, and we can truthfully say that he teaches in all things by example as well as by precept. Tuscumbia Missionary Baptist Church. The history of this church has undergone many changes, but they all worked for its betterment. 
At the close of the Civil War the few members went from Brush Arbor to Brush Arbor for three years. Then they held services in gin houses and under shelters for two years and six months. Then, as the church was growing rapidly, they thought best to draw out, buy a lot, and build to themselves. So they bought a lot for what they paid $50, $50, and erected a $500, $500, building thereon in which to worship the Lord. So the church continued to grow until it now has a membership of 900, a splendid brick edifice worth about $6,000, $6,000, and a thriving congregation. The church has never had but one pastor, and I have been as faithful as a clock. Through me, Rev. W. E. Northcross, the church was built, and I have ever since held high the Baptist doctrine throughout North Alabama. Interview with Wade Owens Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama Wade Owens heard Abe Lincoln speak. The Rev. Wade Owens of Opelika was born in Lochapoca, Alabama, in 1863 and just missed slavery. But he has heard his home folks talk so much about freeing the Negroes, he feels as if he was grown then. His mother and father, Wade and Hannah Owens, came from Virginia and moved into Jenks Quarters, on the Barry Owens Place. They had several children, Wade, Nettie, Chance, Anderson and Iowa. Wade used to help drive up the cows. This cabin was of logs, mud and sticks with leaf and mud chimneys and slab floors. The beds fitted into the wall with plank sides, two posts with planks nailed on top, resembling tables. A box served as a dresser. All ash cakes were cooked on poplar and chestnut leaves, when they roasted taters, Wade says. Us chillin used to go early in the morning and lick the honey often the leaves for sweets den. Us didn't wear nothin, but our long shirts, and us had homemade hats and brogans, hard as bricks with brass caps on the toes. I thought day was the prettiest things I ever seed. Marcia Berry and Miss Fanny Owens was good to us niggers. My daddy was the carriage driver for Miss Fanny, but take care of dat man Ben Body, the overseer. He was the means man God ever put life in. He wouldn't let us have no fire, matter not how cold, us had to work just the same or the nigger hounds you de show get you. If a not dog caught, they would beat you to death nearly. He was so mean Marsa run him off. Day blue de risin, horn and us work from daylight, twelve dark or from can to cant. Marsa had a pretty two-story log house, big columns and big porch. He had, bout two or three hundred acres and, worked, bout three hundred slaves. Us had a jail and locked runaways in hit. Brother Lockhart used to preach to us niggers in the white church at Lebanon and us walked to hit. My daddy was sold fair $160. When day put chains on the niggers day was put ruined the legs and arms and to a post. Day took pains to hope he my mammy and pappy to learn. Day would teach the Bible to them too. Marcia used to sing dem good old songs, my heart from the tomb, a doleful sound. My ears attend to cry, and amazing grace how sweet it sounds. At baptizing day give the water invitation and den go in water. And didn't they come out happy, shouting and praying? Old man Buck could hear dem two miles off, but hit was a glorious baptizing. All the hands stopped and day was a funeral and didn't work no mo till the body was buried. All the whites would go too. Day would make the boxes, pour hot water over the plank to shape it up into a casket, then take turpentine and smut to paint it. Then another big time, set tin up with the dead, sing, shout and holler and try to preach. The patrollers would come to the colored frolic, and one time a Han, slipped off and, gentlemen, didn't he give, em trouble to catch him, and they didn't. When they had dem saddy night frolics and dance all night long and nearly day when hit was going, they would turn the pot upside down in the floor to hold the sewn in. My daddy picked the banjo. At the corn shuckings they'd sing, all rune the corn pile sally, and they had whiskey and gin. Us had good time on Christmas, give us toys, syrup candy, light bread and grape wine. 
My brother married up at the big house and they give him a big dance and Marsa made me drunk. Twas fust one den t'other give it to me and knocked me out. They had the preacher and didn't jump the broom. They had the preacher so would be tied good. They would tell us chillin' all kinds of ghost stories, bout witches gettin' outer day skins. Us had free jumping grapevine ropes and mumble peg. One night I was at Nadasolga and I heard some singing. I stopped and hit was right at my feet and would go further off. I took out with hit and hit kept stoppin' and startin' off ag and twelve hit give out entirely. I looked to see where I was and I was at the cemetery and nothing didn't bother me neither. I eased out and shut the gate and never found what carried me dear. When us ud get sick, they would bleed you, stick sampan in your arm and draw the blood. Then they would give us scurry grass and fever weed. Bone set was used as teas for colds and fever to sweat you. And hit show would sweat you, too. Marsa said war was comin' and thought hit was to free us. Happy went to war with young Marsa and stayed twelve he got killed. Rev. Wade Owens, Opelika, Alabama. They hid the carriage horses, meat, silver and plates. Yankees asked if and Marsa was good, and Bus said yes. They searched the smokehouse and some scraps no good and nothin' but scrappy horses so they didn't bother a thing. Us stayed one year and worked on one-eighth farm. The Ku Klux Klan was tobel. One John Lyons would cut off a woman's breast and a man's ear or thumb. Adder I got growed I married Layla Benford at Mr. Lockhart's house, and us had a nice little frolic, with cake, syrup pudding and wine. It was a fine night with me, Kays all kissed the bride. Us had fourteen children, Jess eight living, Minnie, Wade, Robert, Walter, Viola, Joe, Jim and Johnny, and ten grandchildren. I heard Abraham Lincoln speak once at Shikamagi Mountain and he said, for people, by people, and through people. I always, remembered that. I gene the church, case I got converted. Interview with Molly Parker. Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. He was a good overseer and treated slaves right. Down in Lower Lee County I found Molly Parker, an old acquaintance, ailing, and with the wandering mind of the aged. She could find answers to some of my questions, but some she couldn't get straight. She was just as clean and neat as she had always been, clad in an apron dress that she would call a Mother Huggard. Molly is eighty-five years old and lives with her sister Edna in a simple cabin, with a little patch of flowers between it and the field where Edna is still young enough to work. Molly was a housewife's treasure in the days gone by, but now she is too feeble to do more than work her little patch of flowers. Molly Parker, Lee County, Alabama. She was born in Virginia but was brought to Alabama when a child and sold to a Mr. Dunn, near Salem. Her mother and father were John and Fanny, the parents of four children, Molly, Edna, Sam and Albert. I was a big-size housegirl, but I show could work, Molly recalled. Mr. Digby blowed a big bugle early every morning to get us all up and going by bright light. Mr. Digby was a good overseer and treated all the slaves the best he knew how. I married Dick Parker on a Sunday and they fixed us a big dinner with more good things to eat, but I was too happy to eat much myself. I ain't had no chillin' of my own, but I hope had mammy with hern. The Yankees done camped nigh our house, and I had to help cook and tote the grub down to M. Us read in the free paper, about us being free. Massa didn't tell us nothing, but us stayed on for a long time adder dat Massa had a passel of slaves. Yesum, I see a member of the church. Why I jeaned. Just for protection, I reckon. I'd hate to see slavery time ag in, cause hit show was bad for some of the niggers, but us fared good though. Interview with Lindy Patton. Alice S. Barton, Utah, Alabama. Fifty years in the Puh House. White folks, said Lindy Patton, from a chair in the Green County Poor House. I was born in 1841 and it taken me fifty years to get to the Puh House. 
Now I is got just FOMO years to make it an even 50 dad I been dear. I hopes I makes the grade, case dat would be some sort of wrecked, wouldn't it? 50 years in the puh house. Lindy Patton, TR, Utah, Alabama. I walked in the fields and I worked hard all day long. The white folks you see to gimme the clothes of the lil white chillins. I was born in Knoxville, Alabama, in Greene County, and I belonged to Massa Bill Patton. I remembers a slave on our plantation that was always a runin away. The Massa try beatin' him but dat didn't do no good. Dat nigger would run away in spite of nothin' they could do. One day the Massa decided he was goin' to take the nigger to Mobile and swap him for another one. The Mistis told him to leave the old fool alone, said it weren't worth the trouble. Well, the Massa started out to Mobile with the nigger, and when the got dear and the train stop, the nigger, he lit out and the Massa runned right behind him. They must a run a mile or mo, till finally the Massa he give out and let the nigger go. Two days later the Massa he died FMA chasin' dat low down burr head. Nazu, the white folks didn't teach us to read or write. White folks, I can't hardly count none at all. We didn't have no church on dat place neither. We just went along with the Massa and sot in the back. I ain't never my ed, and I ain't never goin' to. Interview with Simon Phillips. J. Morgan Smith. EX slave leader recalls old days. Simon Phillips, ex slave, at 90 years is still as clear thinking as a young man, and a leader among the oldsters of his race in Birmingham and Alabama. He has been for the past 23 years president of the Union of Ex Slaves, which is composed of 1,500 Negroes scattered throughout Alabama. He is the only one of the Birmingham organizers of the society living today and though one of the oldest of his group, he shows but few signs of decrepitude. He walks with the aid of a hickory cane which has been in his possession for almost a half century, and his memory is not only accurate but vivid. His physical activity is shown by the fact that he had already spaded his garden and tiny stalks had pushed themselves above the ground on a plot of earth, covering approximately 75 yards square. On the spring morning when he took a little time off to talk of the past. Well does he recall the days when, under Alabama skies in the 1860s, he curried his master's fine carriage horses, the times old Aunt Hannah cured him of atchins with vegetable and root herbs. The nights he spent in the slave quarters singing spirituals with his family. Simon Phillips was one of 300 Negroes belonging to Bryant Watkins, a planter of Greensboro, Alabama. He was a house man, which means that he mixed the drinks, opened the carriage doors, brought refreshments on the porch to guests, saw that the carriage was always in the best of condition and tended the front lawn. When asked about slave days, he gets a faraway expression in his eyes, an expression of tranquil joy. People, he says, has the wrong idea of slave days. We was treated good. My masa never laid a hand on me during the whole time I was with him. He scolded me once for not bringing him a drink when I was supposed to, but he never whooped me. The old slave added that every plantation had a still and there was much brandy, but he rarely ever saw a drunk man. He says that when the men felt themselves becoming intoxicated, they would go home and lie down, now, he says, they go home and fall down. The plantation on which Simon lived was seven miles long and three miles wide. When luncheon was served, the Negroes far off in the bottom lands had their food brought to them by the trash gang, boys and women, while those in the nearer cotton fields ate in a large mess hall. The food consisted of turnip greens, meat, peas, crackling bread and syrup, and plenty of it. Not since those days, he states, have I had such good food. What about the marriage situation, Simon, he was asked. How did you go about getting a wife? Well, nigger just go to the Massa and tell him that there's a gal over in Captain Smith's place that he want for a wife, if she happened to be there. Then the Massa go to Captain Smith and offer to buy her. Maybe he do and maybe he don't. It depend on whether the captain will sell her, and if and she a good strong, healthy nigger. Niggers was bought mostly like hosses. I was too young to have me a wife when I was with the Massa, 
but I got me one later on after the war. Simon Phillips, Birmingham, Alabama During the war between the states, Simon served as bodyguard for John Edward Watkins, son of the plantation owner. Bodyguards went with their owners and cleaned the guns, kept the camp in order and did some cooking. Simon entered the war at the age of 14 in Joe Wheeler's 51st Cavalry. He distinctly recalls the time he stood within ten feet of the great general while he was making a speech. Sometimes slaves were parted from their families, because when one planter bought a negro from another planter, he did not necessarily buy his wife or children, or husband, as the case might be. The slaves were advertised around and put on a block to stand while they were auctioned. Women invariably brought more than men. He was asked, about overseers, Simon. What sort of men were they? Well, he answered, some was mighty mean. When the Masa be away, they tried to think up things to whoop us for. But when the Masa around, had he catch them getting ready for to beat a slave, he say, don't cut no blood from that nigger. Born in Hale County in 1847, Simon Phillips stayed with his master until 1886 at which time he went to live in Tuscaloosa to earn 17 cents a day, but he says he fared better on it than on three dollars now. After the war many Negroes stayed with their masters and he remembers that some of the carpetbaggers came through his plantation and tried to make the ex-slaves stake off the land, saying that half of it belonged to them. One day, says Simon, a few niggers was stickin' sticks in the ground when the masa come up. What you niggers doin', he asked. We is stakin' off the land, masa. The Yankees say half of it is orn. The masa never got mad. He just looked calm like. Listen, niggers he says, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours. You are just as free as I and the missus, but don't go foolin' around my land. I've tried to be a good master to you. I have never been unfair. Now if you wants to stay, you are welcome to work for me. I'll pay you one-third the crops you raise. But if you wants to go, you seize the gate. The Masa never have no more trouble. Them niggers just stays right there and works. Sometime they loaned the Masa money when he was hard pushed. Most of them died on the old grounds. I was the youngest of a family of sixteen and I has one sister still living on the old plantation. I'm going down to see her next week, cause I can never tell when the great master is going to call. We gotta be ready when he does, and both us is getting mighty old. I want to be sure and see her and the old place once more. Interview with Roxy Pitts Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama Roxy Pitts recalls childhood. I don't know exactly where I was born, said Aunt Roxy Pitts, but it was some as Rune Youngsboro, Alabama, and it was in 1855, F.O. De Wa started. Dat old Marster said I was born. How old dat make me? 82, Gwine on 80 Tiri. Dat's right, and I be 80 Tiri year old this time next year, if and I lives. Yasum, I goes to church putty reglar, if and it don't rain. Cause the rain makes the misery in my hip and lays me up. I belongs to the Baptist church and was baptized with Jesus when I was twelve year old. I is a foot washin, Baptist, I is, but they ain't none of dem kinder Baptist rune here, and I just goes with the utter Baptist and sets in the Amen corner, and if an I wants to shout, I shouts, and nobody ain't gonna stop me, bless the Lord. My first master was named Sam Jones, but I don't remember him. My other master, the one what I th members, was named Sam Pegg, and us lived close to a little town named Limekill. My mammy was part Injun, and old master cuttin' keep her home no workin' neither, she allus runnin' off and stay out in the woods all night long. When I was a little gal, she runned off a g and and left, a teeny little baby, and never did come back no mo. Day said she gone war the Injuns is. Dat was at her de wa, and pappy had to raise dat little bitsy baby hisself. He tuck it and me to de fiel, war he workin, and kept a bottle of sweeten water in his shirt to keep warm to give de baby when it cry. Den pappy he might aunt Josie and day had a whole passel or chillins, and day was my brothers and sisters. 
member bout de wa. Show, Ike members bout de wa, but us don't have no wa war us was. Ole Marster got kilt in Virginie, they said, and he didn't never come back home, and dem what did come back was all crippled up and hurt. Us didn't see no Yankees, twel day come along adder de wa was gone, and day tuck ol Misty's good hosses and lef some po ol mules, and day tuck all us koan and didn't lef us nuttin to eat in de smokehouse. Day runned off all the chickens day cuttin catch, and jess fo day lef, the ol rooster flewed up on de fence, hind de orchard and crow, is de Yankees joni e. And the guinea set tin on de lot fence, say, not yet, not yet, and the old drake what was hid under the house, he say, hushichich, hushichich. Us chillin's show was mish us. One time, adder a big rain, us found two hens swimmin' around in the tater house, and us tuck and held them under the water twelve days done drown dead dead, and we tuck em to mammy and she cooked em in a pot and shot the kitchen do. When dem chickens got done, us went under the flow and riz up a plank and got in the kitchen and stole one ob dem chickens out in the pot and et it smack up. When mammy found dat chicken gone, she tuck her brush broom and wa us plum out. But us didn't care. The brush broom didn't hurt nigh lack the chickens taste good. Aunt Roxy nodded her head and rocked back and forth, as if she enjoyed recalling those youthful escapades. Yasum, I can see plenty good enough to sew, Sepen, I can't tread the needle, and I has to keep at her dees triflin, chillins to heapy me. You see dis quilt I s e piecein. Miss Lucy Gwine give me three dollars for it, cause she say it be made right, and dat's the way I makes em. Miss Lucy know she got er good quilt, when I gets tru with it. Is you got any snuff, missy? You don't dip snuff. No me, I didn't think you did. Interview with Carrie Pollard. Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama. A husband couldn't be bought. Carrie Pollard was born in slavery time but she was never a slave. Her grandmother was a free woman who came to Tuscaloosa as a servant in the 1820s and was rescued from a man who claimed ownership, but whose claim was disallowed. The grandmother went to Gainesville, with her slave husband for whom she bought freedom. One of her daughters, who was Carrie Pollard's Aunt Cynthia, was not so lucky. She couldn't buy her husband free. The story, told so often to Carrie when she was a child, is still a bright memory to the mulatto woman who was born in 1859 and still lives in Gainesville in the house of her birth. Carrie Pollard, Gainesville, Alabama. My Aunt Cynthia, said Carrie, was free born in North Carolina. She come down here to Gainesville, and though the deed says you can't take a blue vein chili and make a slave out of her, the man what brought her made like he owned her or something. She lived on one plantation with her guardian. Tom Dobbs, a slave nigger what belonged to Mr. Dobbs here in Gainesville, he lived on another farm cross the road. And they couldn't marry, Kay's mister. Dobbs wouldn't sell Tom and Aunt Cynthia's white folks wouldn't let her marry, so they just taken up and went ahead. Her and Tom had nine chillin, as fine-looking mulattoes EZ you'd want to see. An old Mr. Dobbs wanted em and he couldn't get em. Aunt Cynthia was a good midwife, so a white lady sent fair her to come to Sumterville, Alabama, to nuss her and she went. And while she was dear, she dreamed something done happened to her chillin and that day was in trouble. So she told the white lady she was nussin' bout what she dreamed and she said, Mammy, if an you is worried bout your chillin eyes Gwinnitor send you to a fortune teller and see what's the matter. The fortune teller cut the cards, and then she looked up and told Aunt Cynthia, all yo, chillin and your husband done gone and I can't tell you where day's at. So Aunt Cynthia run back and told the white lady. She called her husband and he had one of his niggers saddle up two hosses and ride with Aunt Cynthia back to Gainesville. When she found her guardian, Mr. Steele, he met her with the news that day was tucked to DeKalb, Mississippi. He got on his hoss and tucked some other white men with him, and they captured old man Dobbs right dear with Tom and the nine chillin. They done stopped and camped and was cooking supper. So Mr. Steele told him he could keep Tom, case he was his son, 
and a slave, but Cynthia was free born and he couldn't have her chillin'. But Mr. Dobbs says he didn't want Tom know how, case he was part Indian and no countin' wouldn't work. So Mr. Steele bought Tom for Aunt Cynthia and brought him all back to live with him. And he give Aunt Cynthia and Tom and the chillin' a nice house right cross the branch here after surrender. Carrie tells of how her grandmother used to send them to the mill in Gainesville with wheat, just like you do corn nowadays, to get flour. And us get the grudgeons and the seconds and have the best buckwheat cakes you ever eat. She says there are more black negroes now in Gainesville than she has ever seen. She says, it used to be a sight to see about fifty best-looking mulatto girls up in the public square here listening to the band and nussin the chillin, not five black ones in the bunch. And they had good sense, too. Us didn't have no clocks, so us white misties would say, y'all come home a hour by sun to do the night work, and us didn't hardly ever miss it. She says her grandmother sent her two daughters to school in Mobile, and they went down the river from Gainesville in a river boat called Cremonia. Interview with Irene Poole Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama Hush water for talkative women under the spreading branches of an enormous fig tree laden with ripe fruit, Aunt Irene sat dreaming of old times. At her feet several chickens scratched and waited for the soft plop of an overripe fig as it fell to the ground. Aunt Irene's back is bent with age and rheumatism, but her two-room cabin is as clean and neat as a pin. Her small yard is a mass of color where marigolds, zinnias, verbena and coxcomb run riot, and over the roughly made arch at the gate trailed cypress vine in full bloom. Good morning Aunt Irene, I said. A penny for your thoughts. Well honey, I don't know as day is what th a penny, not to you anyhow. I was just stud in, bout old times and, bout my old Mars tur. You know if he was livin, today he would be a hundred and sixteen years old. Who was your master Aunt Irene? Tell me about him. His name was Jeff Anderson Poole and he was the best man in the world. Ma ol' miss was named Molly. I was born on his plantation three miles from Uniontown 85 years ago. Ma pappy, Alfred Poole, belonged to Moss Jeff and he bought ma mammy, Palestine Kent, from another plantation, cause ma pappy Jess Cooden do no work fair thinkin' bout her. Moss Jeff paid fifteen hundred dollars for my mammy and her three little chillin. Moss Jeff was rich, he owned three big plantations and laud knows how many niggers. Day was a hundred head on our plantation. He lacked to race horses and had a stable full o' fine racers. I spec he made lots o' his money on dem horses. Miss Molly say when he when he swell out his cheese and stick his thumbs in the armhole of his V.E.S. and talk bout it, but when he lose he don't say nothing. Yas ma'am dear was always plenty to eat. A thousand pounds o' oh, meat wasn't nothing to kill on our plantation. My mammy was the cook in the big house and my pappy drive the carriage and went ruin with Moss Jeff when he tuck trips. I was a house servant too. When I was not nothing the mo in a baby, the overseer's wife tucked me to train, so I would know how to AC in the big house. One day she started to give me a weapon. Us was out in the yard and when she bent over to get a switch I runned under her hoop skirt. When she looked rune, she didn't see me now har. After while she started on up to the house and I runned along with her under the hoop skirt, tucking little steps so I wouldn't trip her up, till I see the chance to slip out. Irene threw back her head and laughed loud and long at this amusing memory. Ask then about her mistress she said, yes ma'am she was good. She never punished me, she used to go ruin the quarters evie morning to see about her sick niggers. She always had a little basket with oil, tepentine and number six in it. Number six was strong medicine. You had to take it by the drap. I always toted the basket. She give me my wed din dress. It was white tarlatan with bands o' oh, blue ribbon. I sold the dress last year but I can show you the pantalettes she made me. I used to wear em to meetin' on Sunday when us had singin' and the preacher said words. 
Aunt Irene brought out the deep ruffled pantalettes carefully folded and yellow with age, she had treasured them for seventy-five years. No ma'am, Moss Jeff didn't go to the war, I don't know why. I guess it was, cause he was so rich. Now don't you be thinkin', he was gun shy, cause he wasn't an, he done his part too cause he took care o, oh, five widders and day chillin when day men got killed in the war. My pappy left the night the Yankees tuck Selma. It was on Sunday, and I ain't seed him since. After the surrender us stayed on with Moss Jeff. Us didn't care nothin' bout bein' free cause us had good times on the plantation. On sad day they had corn shuckins and the niggers had a week at Christmas with presents for Eva body. Camping at the big house in Mo to eat in one day Dan I sees now in a year. Aunt Irene, do you remember anything about the conjurers in the old days? I don't put much sto by dem folks. They used to give you the han so you could please yo, Miss Tess and they would sell you hush water in a jug. Hush water was just plain water what they fixed so if you drink it you would be quiet and patient. The men's would get it to give to day wives to make them hush up. I reckon some of the men's would be glad to get some now cause gals these days is got too much mouth. Interview with Nicey Pew. Isla B. Prime, H.W., Mobile. I was bound a slave, but I ain't never been a slave, was Aunt Nicey's first remark to me as I came upon her pulling up potato draws in her garden in Pritchard, Alabama. Dear was Laban Chillins in my family and all M is Dade Septon, me and one brother who is seventy-five year old at the present time. My pappy's name was Hamp West and my mammy was Sarah West. All my folks belonged to Massa Jim Bettis, and was born and raised on his place. When I was a little pickaninny, I worked in Massa Jim's house, sweeping and a cleaning. Us slaves had to be up at the house by sunup, build the fires and get the cooking started. They had big open fireplaces with pot racks to hang the pot on. Dats wore us boiled the vegetables. And, honey, us show had plenty sampen to eat greens, taters, peas, rosiniers and plenty of home-killed meat. Sometimes my oldest brother, Joe West, and Friday Davis, another nigger, went hunting at night and caught demo possums than we could eat. They'd catch lots of fish, enough to loss us three days. I remembers one day when me and another little nigger gal was a-going adder the cows down in the fiel and bus seed what I reckon was the Ku Klux Klan. Us was so scared us didn't know what to do. One of em walked up to us and say, niggers, were you a-going? Us is just adder the cows, Mr. Ku Klux, us say. Us ain't up to no debilment. All right then, they say, just you be show dat you don't get up to none. Adder we got home us told the massa, bout the, experience, and he just laugh. He told us dat we weren't going to be hurt if and we was good. He say dat it was only the bad niggers dat was goin' to be got adder by dem Ku Klux. When we was little we didn't have no games to play, cause a massa Jim and Miss Marfa didn't have no chillins, and I ain't never had no experiences with high ts or hoodoos. They never teach us to read or write cause a when the niggers learn anything, they would get you pity and want to run away. We would have sad day afternoons off, then us would sweep the yards, and sat around on benches and talk. It was on the benches that most of us slaves sat in warm weather. We eat ye out in tin cups and us used iron spoons to shovel the food in. At Christmas time, Massa would have a bunch of niggers to kill a hog and barbecue him, and the women's would make lasses cake, and old Massa Jim had some kind of seed dat he made beer outen, and we alls drank beer, ruined Christmas. But dear weren't no other time such as New Year's. Us all celebrated in a big way den. Most of dem no count niggers stayed drunk fo three days. And as fo the funerals, I don't even remember but three white folks dying. They just didn't seem to die in dem days, and the ones that did die was mostly killed by Sompen. One white gent man got hisself killed in a gin, chinery and another was killed a workin' on the big road. Then dear was a white, Oman who was killed by a nigger boy cause she beat him for sicking a dog on a fine milk cow. 
he was the meanest nigger boy I eber seed. I'll never forgets the way dem white men's treated him adder he done had his trial. They drug him through the town behind a hoss, and made him walk over sharp stones with his bare feets, that bled like somebody done cut em with a knife. They never give him no water all that day and kept him out in the boiling sun till they got ready to hang him. When they got ready to hang him they put him up on a stand and chunked rocks at his naked body. They threw gravel in his eyes and broke his ribs with big rocks. Then they put a rope around his neck and strung him up till his eyes pop out in his head. I knowed it was a blessing to him to die. But all in all, white folks, then was the really happy days for us niggers. Course we didn't have the vantages that we has now, but dear was sompen back dear that we ain't got now, and that's a CCU 80. Yasu, we had somebody to go to when we was in trouble. We had a masa dat would fight fo us and help us and laugh with us and cry with us. We had a misties dat would nuss us when we was sick, and comfort us when we had to be punished. I sometimes wish I could be back on the old place. I can see the cool house now packed with fresh butter and milk and cream. I can see the spring down amongst the willows and the water a trickling down between little rocks. I can hear the turkeys a goblin in the yard and the chickens a running around in the sun and shuffling in the dust. I can see the bend in the creek just below our house, and the cows as they come to drink in the shallow water and gets dear feet's cool. Nicey Pew, Pritchard, Alabama. Yasu, white folks, you ain't never seed nothin' like it so you can't tell the joy you gets f I'm lookin' for dewberries and a huntin' guinea pigs, and settin' in the shade of a peach tree. Reachin' up and pullin' off a ripe peach and eatin' it slow. You ain't never seed your people gathered bout and singin' in the moonlight or hear the lark at the break of day. You ain't never walked across a frosty fiel in the early mornin' and gone to the big house to build a fire for your misties, and when she wake up slow have her say to you, well, how's my little nigger today? Nazu, just like I told you at fuss. I was bound a slave, but I ain't never been one. I see been a worker for good peoples. You wouldn't calls that bein a slave would you, white folks. Personal Conversation with Sally Reynolds 552, South Conception Street, Mobile, Alabama Compiled by Mary A. Poole Satan's going round with his tail curled up. Sally Reynolds, living at 552, South Conception Street, was busy at the wash tub when the writer called to interview her on July 20, 1937. So it being a hot day we decided to continue our conversation outdoors under the wash shed amid a conglomeration of tubs, buckets, empty boxes, etc. Sally said she was born in Hilltone, Georgia, where her mother Margaret Owens was a slave and the cook on the plantation of Mr. Lit Alberton. When Sally was about three years of age her mother gave her to Mrs. Beck Alberton, who lived at New Providence, near Rutledge in Crenshaw County, Alabama to whom she was bound until twenty-one years of age. There was also a brother given by her mother to some folks in Florida and of whom Sally never had any knowledge whatever. Sally said Mrs. Alberton was kind to her, taught her to spin and sew, and she tried to learn herself to weave, but, somehow, could never master it. Mrs. Alberton had only a few slaves who were named, Mose, Dan, Charles, Sandy, the latter so called because he ate sand as a child, and two women, Hannah and Teen. They had no regular quarters but just cabins out in a rear lot. Sally said all the whippings were given by either of the young Messrs. Alberton, they were high-tempered, as their father was before them. She laughed and said she had Indian blood in her veins and sometimes she was sassy as she felt independent knowing Mrs. Alberton would always take her part. She recalled the Yankees coming through after the war, one remained at the Alberton home after the others had gone on, and she remembered hearing Mrs. Alberton telling friends who visited her, that after this soldier had left he wrote Mrs. Alberton a letter, telling her to look on the back of the bench on the gallery where he had sat and she would find his message. Sally said she was a little girl sitting on the floor at her mistress' feet, 
ready to fetch and carry for her and she often wondered but didn't dare ask what the message was. She did, however, hear someone say that the Yankees said, if they ever came again, they would take them from the cradle and that puzzled her, to know just what they meant. Mrs. Alberton had a regular herb garden and Sally helped her to gather the herbs, pennyroyal, dock sage, tansy, single and double, thyme, and yarrow. They used samson snake root in whiskey for cramps, and butterfly weed for risings. The writer asked Sally about church and she said they had no church but Mr. Alberton talked to her and impressed on her as a child to never touch anything that did not belong to her. Ask for it and if not given to her, to let it alone and to never lie, or to carry tales, and she could always keep out of trouble. Sally said she hated to see Sunday morning come, as the men folks were around the house and they would pick on her and somehow she would get a beating. Sally remained with Mrs. Alberton until she was twenty-two years, when she married John Russell, by whom she had three children. They all died as babies, later she married Gus Reynolds, now dead, so Sally just rents a room and lives alone. Sally says present generation knows too much and too little, that the old-time religion was best for all, she thinks Satan's going round with his tail curled up, catching all he can devour. And folks should do like Christ did when Satan tried to tempt him, and tell Satan to go get behind them, and they get behind Jesus they could not have sorrow run across their hearts and minds. Interview with Mary Rice Gertha Couric, H.W., Ufala. Dies uppity niggers. Few of the ex-slaves will readily admit that they were mere field hands in the old days. Generally they prefer to leave the impression that they were house servants, or at least stable boys or dairy hands. But Aunt Mary Rice, age 92, who lives in Eufaula, holds no such view about the superior social position of house servants. She was a big missy gal, teenage, during the war, and about her duties on the plantation of Dr. Cullen Battle near Tuskegee, where she was born, she said. Honey, I lived in the quarter. I was a fiel, nigger, but when I was a lil, gal, I helped around the milk house, churnin', washing the pails and the lack, and then give all the little niggers milk. Mary Rice, Eufaula, Alabama. Massa Cullen and Misty's Mai Jane was the best Mars Tur and Misty's in the world. Once when I was awful sick. Misty's Mai Jane had me brung in the big house and put me in a room dat sot on de tother side of the kitchen so she could take care of me herself, cause it was a right fur piece to the quarter and I had to be nuss day and night. Yassam, I was just as happy bein a fiel han as I would have been at de big house, mebimo so. De fiel hans had a long spell when the crops was laid by in the summer and dats when Masa Cullen load us to jubilati, several days of idle celebration. I was happy all the time in slavery days, but dear ain't much to get happy over now, sep and eyes livin', thank the Lord. Massa Cullen was a rich man, and owned all the world from Chestnut Hill to the Rivers, and us always had everything us needed. Niggers these days ain't never knowed what good times is. Meb dat's why they ain't no count. And they is so uppity, too, callin' dearers elves, colored folks and havin' gold teeth. Day says the mo gold teeth day has, the higher up in Chu ch day sets. Ha! Huh. Interview with Cornelia Robinson. Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. The Yankees was a hurricane. One time I members a storm us had. I calls it a hurricane, but it was really the Yankees coming through. Quaint, little Cornelia Robinson was anxious to give all the facts she could remember about slavery days but she was only about four years old during the latter days of that period, and must depend a great deal on what has been told her. Chili, dem Yankees come through and, cleaned out the smokehouse, even left, the lard bucket as clean as yo, hand. Ole Mars Tur tuck his best horses and mules to the big swamp, and, the Yankees couldn't fin dem. But they tore up everything they couldn't take with dem. They poured all the syrup out and, it run down the road lack water. One poor little nigger boy was so scared that when he went out to get up to cows and, when he couldn't fin, some of em, he laid down in a hollow stump and nearly froze to death. They had to thaw him out in the branch, but he was powerful sick. 
he warranty no count for nothing at her dat. I, members dat old mistress saved all her jewels and sec from the Yankees. She brung em out to the nigger cabins and hid em amongst us. Cornelia, forever smiling, wears her gray hair in two short braids down the back. She says her father and mother were George and Harriet Yancey, who belonged first to a Mrs. Baugh and who were later sold to a Dr. Trammell, of near Lafayette. Her brothers and sisters were Charlie, Willie, Albert and Anne. Cornelia Robinson, Opelika, Alabama. Ike members de high, four-poster beds us used her sometimes sleep on, she said. I was so little dat I had to crawl into M with the help of a stool. I, members dat de mud fireplaces of early times was far back, deep and wide. All the little niggers was fed milk and bread, with the bread crumbled in. Us also had pot liquor and greens. Our clothes was muslin and calico for the hot weather, and den in winter us had linty cloth, part wool and part cotton, homespun. Us raised a sheep, too, but us didn't wear no clothes hardly in hot weather. Us show, did have a good Mars tur and misties. They give us all the clothes and food us needed and give us medicine. Us wore asafetida and pennies around our necks to help us not to get sick. They taught my mother to read and write, too. Not many done dat. She'd read the Bible to us little niggers and give prayers. At her slavery, us had schools. I, members dat George Hawkins and his wife taught it. Cornelia recalls some of the happenings of slavery times. If the slaves went off the plantation without a pass, the paterollers would catch em and beat em powerful bad. If the niggers could outrun the paterollers and get home fust day couldn't be whopped. They had dogs called nigger hounds, same like they had bird dogs, and they would track the slaves and bring them back home. I, members my mother goin' to corn shuckins. Course day put us little niggers to bed for day went but day show sounded like day was havin a big time, hollerin and singin. Us went to the white folks church in the afternoon, and had a reverend gardener was a mighty good preacher. When any of us niggers died, Marster was good to us and let all the niggers quit and attend the burial. They made the coffins at home and would black them with soot. Us had a old quack herb doctor on the place. Some bad boys went up to his house one night and poured a whole lot of the medicine down him. And honey, that old man died the next day. Adder I got grown I married Robert Benson and us had four chillin and several grandchildren. Cornelia, beaming and apparently happy every minute of the day, lives with one of her grandchildren in Opelika. Interview with Gus Rogers. Mary A. Poole, Mobile, Alabama. Jabbo explains his black skin. Living on the Moffat Road at Orchard, in western Mobile County, Alabama, on Mr. McIntyre's place is Gus Rogers, who is known better by the name of Jabbo. He claims to be over ninety years of age, but could give no proof. He claims the 26th of June as his birthday. When asked how old he was, he replied with a smile. Miss, I don't know but I found everything here when I came along. He was born at Salisbury, North Carolina on the Rogers Plantation, and Mr. John and Mrs. Mary Rogers were his master and mistress. His parents were William and Lucy Rogers, who had five children, three girls, and two boys. Jabbo said the Rogers's home was built of boards of virgin timber and the slave quarters were some distance from the big house. Some of the cabins were built of logs and some of boards, all having clay chimneys and big open fireplaces equipped for cooking, as the slaves usually cooked their own meals, except during busy seasons. When meals were prepared in the house kitchen by the slave women too old to work in the fields. Jabbo said one old man went around and rapped on the doors to wake up slaves to go to work. When asked how long they worked he laughed and said. Just from sun to sun and then you went to bed, cause you knew that old man would sure be rapping before you were ready next morning. When asked about earning any money, Jabbo said. Law, miss we didn't even know what money was, and we didn't have no use for it. We had all we needed, plenty to eat and all the clothes necessary those days. 
The Rogers raised lots of tobacco and wheat, and all the necessary farm products needed on the plantation. They had a large orchard and made all the cider they could drink. Jabo recalled driving many a refugee wagon during the war, and when they heard of the Yankees coming, the Rogers family took all the horses and mules and hid them in the swamps and buried all the silver and other valuables. After the devastation wrought by war, Mr. Rogers moved his family to Massey Station, Montgomery County, Alabama, intending to raise cotton. He brought Jabo's father and mother and family with him, but meeting with little success he returned to Salisbury, North Carolina Jabo remained in Alabama. Jabo married and raised a family of five children. There were two girls and three boys but he has no knowledge of their present whereabouts. When asked if he was married more than once, Jabo laughed and said. No, miss I always had the price of a marriage license in my pocket, but somehow I never married. In answer to inquiry as to religion, Jabo replied. Miss, I am a Methodist, but there's only one religion. You have to be pure in heart to see him, because he said so, and to do unto others as you desire others to do unto you. Continuing about religion Jabo said. God gave it to Adam and took it away from Adam and gave it to Noah, and you know, miss, Noah had three sons, and when Noah got drunk on wine, one of his sons laughed at him. And the other two took a sheet and walked backwards and threw it over Noah. Noah told the one who laughed, You children will be hewers of wood and drawers of water for the other's two children, and they will be known by their hair and their skin being dark, so, miss, there we are, and that is the way God meant us to be. We have always had to follow the white folks and do what we saw them do, and that's all there is to it. You just can't get away from what the Lord said. Jabo said he would like to go back to the good old days, though there was good folks and there was mean folks, then too, just like there is today. Bibliography, personal interview by the writer with Gus Rogers, ex-slave, better known as Jabo. Personal interview with Janie Scott. 255 South Lawrence Street, Mobile, Alabama. Mary A. Poole, Mobile, Alabama. Slave Cielini sold fair a sack o' oh, salt. Janie Scott, living in a cottage at 255 South Lawrence Street, was interviewed by the writer on July 14, 1937. She claimed she was born April 10, 1867, but she appeared older than 70 years of age. She, of course, was unable to give any experiences of her own as a slave but recalled what had been told her by her mother, who was a slave on the Myers Plantation at Tensaw, Alabama. When asked how large was the plantation, Janie answered. Lordy, Chile, many an acre and, about sixty slaves. Her mother worked in the house, and when the field hands were working helped carry water out to them in buckets, each one getting a swallow or two apiece. Her father was Andy White, and was raised on the plantation of John Jewett at Stockton, Alabama. Janie had heard her father say he was a coachman and drove the folks around, also came over in a boat with his master to Mobile to get supplies and groceries, and that they killed many a deer in neighborhoods just north of Bienville Square. Jane said her mother's master and mistress didn't want her mother to marry Andy, because he was too light in color and light niggers Janie said folks didn't think as strong as a good black one so her mother, Sarah Porter. And Andy White her father just borrowed a mule without the master's consent and rode off and were married, anyhow. Janie laughed and said she guessed it was all right after all because they had eleven children, two are now living, Janie and a sister Daisy. When the writer asked if slaves ever earned any money, she replied. They didn't even know what money was. Then she continued, once when my mother was a little girl she asked her mistress to give her fifteen cents, and her mistress wanted to know why she wanted fifteen cents. Her mother replied, I wants to see what money looks like. Her mistress thought she was trying to act smart and in place of fifteen cents she received a whipping. The slaves wore homespun clothes, but her mother remembered having as her best dress one made of merino. The slaves' quarters were log cabins with clay chimneys, and they cooked in the open fireplaces in the winter and in the summer on what they called scaffolds, built out in the yard. These were made of clay foundations with iron rods across on which the pots hung. Janie said her mother was strong and could roll and cut logs like a man, 
and was much of a woman. Then they had a log rolling on a plantation the negroes from the neighboring plantations came and worked together until all the jobs were completed. After each log rolling they gave them molasses to make candy and have a big frolic. During the Civil War when supplies were scarce, especially salt, Mars Tur John rode off taking her mother's sister C.A. Line with him, and when he returned alone his wife, Mrs. Myers, wanted to know where was C.A. Line, and Mars Tur John replied, I sold her for a sack of salt. At first they did not believe him, but C.A. Line never returned and Sarah never saw her sister anymore. After the surrender the Yankees came through and the slaves hid under the house, but the soldiers made them come out and told them they were free, and gave the slaves everything on the place to eat. They all went down to the creek and praised God for what he had done for them. Janie does not believe in charms, hoodoo or fortune tellers, saying. Those folks can't tell you nothing. When Christ was risen he carried all prophets with him and didn't leave any wise folks able to tell things going to happen here on earth, everything Christ wanted folks to know had already happened. Janie did say the best charm she knew of was a bag of asafetida worn around the neck to ward off sickness or to take nine or ten drops in a little water would sure keep the worms down. The slaves got plenty of coons, rabbits and bear meat, and could go fishing on Sundays, as well as turtle hunting. The overseer on the Myers plantation was not a mean man, they had a calaboose or sweat box to punish unruly slaves in place of whipping them. After the surrender her father and mother moved to Mobile, Alabama, and her father continued to work for Mr. Jewett at his mill located at the foot of Palmetto Street on the Mobile River Front. Interview with Malgon Shepherd. Gertha Couric, H.W., Eufaula. Slavery Coming Back. Morgan hopes so. Mistis, I hear slavery times is coming back. Uncle Malgon Shepherd is past eighty. He idled about the front of his tumble-down house in Eufaula, happily recalling the old plantation days. He has never learned to read, and therefore pins a great deal of dependence upon hearsay. Where did you hear about slavery coming back? The interviewer asked him. Well, ma'am, Pear Lack I heard it somewhere. I don't recollect just now. Would you like to have the old times back again, Uncle Maugan? He studied a moment, beamed. Yasim, I would. I see proud I was born a slave. I see too young to member much, but I knows I always had enough to eat and wear den, and I show sure don't now. Uncle Maugan said that he was birthed at Chestnut Hill. That he belonged to Moss and Mistis Rich Wiley, and that his father and mother were Bunk and Betsy Wiley, both field niggers. Maugan had two brothers, Oliver and Monroe, but no sisters. I never seed Ma and Pa much, cept on Sundays, he explained. Day was a loose workin', in the fields and I was out chasin' rabbits and sec mows of the time. At night I just eaty my corn pone and drink my buttermilk and fell on the bed asleep. Malgon remembers one overseer, scornfully referring to him as Puff White Trash. Us slaves called him by his lost name behind his back, the old darky explained, Kazus hated to, Mr. That White Man. Maugan remembers Reconstruction and a great deal about, Adder the Surrender, but says, Recollection ain't so good, on things that happened before. I remembers that I was powerful scared of the Yankee soldiers, he said, but they never hurt nobody. They come through Eufaula and, all us niggers tried to hide, but they just come on by and, laughed at us fair being, scared. Maugan Shepherd. Eufaula, Alabama. More than fifty years ago, Maugan married Kitty. She is about seventy and makes her living washing clothes for the white peoples. They never had any children. Maugan says he never goes anywhere except to church on Sundays. His legs are not so strong anymore, he explains. My old Oman, she show lack to go to funerals, he chuckled. But in these days day takes the body to have it vulcanized, so we can't have no set tin pups. This went hard on Kitty, case she was a mourner. But it didn't do her no good, shoutin' and a mourning all night. She would always come home with her head tied up and her eyes set back in her head. Maugan still works. He is a good yardman, 
but says someday he is just going to drop out, like his pa did. Interview with Alan Sims Preston Klein, Opelika Plenty of food and no trash neither. While interviewing former slaves in the rural sections of Lee County, I ran across Alan Sims, a sturdy old Negro, who proved to have an unusually clear recollection of slavery as the institution appeared to the small boy of that era. He was not old enough to make a workhand at its close. He spoke slowly, but with evident positiveness as to the facts. I remembers lots about slavery times, cause I was right dar. I don't remember much about de war, cause I was too little to know what war was, and the most I seed was when the Yankees come through and burnt up de big house, de barns, de gin house and took all old marsters hosses and mules. And killed de milk cows for beef. They didn't leave us nothing to eat, and us lack to starve to death. Our folks, de the Simses, they come from Virginie. My pappy and mammy was born dear. Day names was Alan Sims and Kitty Sims. My old Marster was Moss Jimmy Sims, and my old Misty's was Miss Creasy. Some of Pappy and Mammy's chillin was born in Virginie, and some of them in Alabama. I was de baby chili, and I was born right on dis very place war us is now. Day had a whole passel of chillin. Dear was Cheney, Becky, Judy, Sam, Phoebe, King, Alex, Jordan and Alan. That's me. Us lived in a log house in the quarter, with a board roof and a old rock fireplace with a stick and dirt chimney. We had plenty wood, and could build Jess as big fire as we need, if the weather was cold. Mammy, she cook ash cake in the fireplace, and it was the best bread I ever eat, better than any dis store bought bread. You ain't never eat no ash cake. Umph, Missy, you don't know what good bread is lack. Old Marster was good to his niggers and all of them, big and little had plenty to eat, and it wa'n't trash neither. Us had ash cake, hoe cake, pone bread, meat and gravy, peas, greens, roast nears, pot liquor, and sweet, taters, Irish taters, and goobers, I speck old Marster's niggers live better dan lots of white folks' lives now. Aunt Mandy, what was too old to work, looked at her all the little nigger chillins, whilst day mammies was working, and she whip us with a brush, if we didn't mind her. But she fuss more dan she whip, and it didn't hurt much, but us cry lack she killing us. When us got sick, old Misty's looked at her us herself, and she gin us oil and turpentine and lobelia and if dat didn't cure us, she sought for the doctor, the same doctor dat come to see her own family. Sometime a old nigger die, and old Marster and old Misty's day cry just lack us did. They put M in a coffin and bury M in the graveyard, with the white preacher dar and nobody didn't work none that day, adder us come back from the graveyard. Our beds was bunks in the corner of the room, nailed to the wall and just one post out in the flow. The little chillin slept crosswise the big bed and it was plumb full in cold weather. Alan Sims, Lee County, Alabama. Our clothes was Osnaburg, spun and weave, right at home, and it show did last a long time. The little niggers Jess wore a long shirt, twelve day got big enough to work in the field, and us had red shoes made at the tan yard to wear in winter time, but us foots was tough and us went barefooted most all the winter too. Us played games too, he nearly, jumping the rope and base. The grown niggers had good time sad day nights, with dances, suppers and Roslyn. The corn shuckings was the biggest time they had, cause the neighbors come and day laughed and hollered nearly all night. Old Marster and Old Misty's lived in a big two-story white house. Day had ten chillin, five boys and five gals, and day all growed up and married off. The old carriage driver was named Clark, and he show was proud. The overseer was Tedder Roberson, and he was mean. He beat niggers a lot, and Bimby Old Marster turned him off. He used to blow the horn way beefo day to get the niggers up, and he work em tell smack dark. Adder the Yankees burned up Everett ing sept the cabins, us jest stayed right dar with old Marster when us freed. Old Marster built a new house for him and old Misty's, but it wa'n't much better dan our cabin day lived dear till day died. When I growed up, 
I married Laura Frazier, and us had a big wedding in a preacher, and didn't jump over no broom like some niggers did. Us had just two chillin' dad lived to be grown. Day is Fillmore and Mary Lou, and us ain't got no grandchildren. When I got grown, I jayin' de Baptist church at rough neck, cause I felt I had done enough wrong, and I been a deacon forty year. Interview with Frank Smith. D.A. Odin. Yasu, it's just like I tell yer. I was born in Old Virginie and my old marster was Dr. Constable and he and us all lived out a piece from Norfolk where you can see the whole ocean. I was writ down in the Bible, just like old marsters utter niggers, and old misties said hit was the sixth day of January in 48 when I was born. How old dat make me now? 89, gwine on 90, that's right. Old marster he died eight years fo, the big war, and old misties, refugeed, down to Alexandria, where her mammy and pappy lived and tuck me and Uncle Dan and Aunt Melissy with her. But she sold my mammy and my pappy and all the rest of the niggers to the man what bought the plantation and us never did see, em no mo. I was the houseboy at old Misty's pappy's house, I disremember his name. But, anyhow, I didn't walk in the field like the other niggers. When the big war started, Ole Misty she tuck me and her chillins and us refugeed, down somewhere's day was a coth house, what they called Culpepper, or something like that, and us lived in town with some mo of Ole Misty's kinfox. But they want her mammy and pappy. The soldiers marched right in front of our house, right by the front gate, and they was gwine to Hopers Ferry to kill old John Brown, what was killin white folks and freen niggers fo daytime. Dat was Mr. Lincoln's job, adder de war. And no niggers want to be free till den. We lived close ter de big hotel war General Lee and a whole passel of soldiers stayed, and dey had the shiniest CLOs I ever seed. Dey was fine gem men and old misty she let me wait on him whilst she didn't need me ter walk around the house, and dey give me a dime lots of times. I shine General Lee's shoes sometimes and he allus gin me a dime and said, that looks nice. Some of the generals just give me the dime and didn't say nothing, but they wasn't big men's like General Lee and old Marster. He was straight and dignified and didn't talk much, but he'd walk up and down on the front gallery and the ordlies brung him telegraphs from Bull Run, war us and the Yankees was fighting. Lawsy Missy, I heard him talking, bout, Bull run, dat day night load somebody's bull had got out and us and the Yankees was trying to catch him and get him back into pastor. Frank Smith, Birmingham, Alabama. When the war got too close to us, old Misty's tuck me and her little gal what was older and me, and left Bunker Dan and Aunt Melissa, and us went to Lynchburg, where her mammy and pappy done moved to. And us stayed with dem A.G. in, but old Misty's was gettin' worried over the war, and when I broke her four y handled dining room knife and forget ter tell her, she slapped my head nearly off and got mad and sold me ter a man what lived in Cleveland. Tennessee. Her pappy tried ter keep Misty's fum sellin' to me. He said all I needed was a good brushin', but nobody couldn't do nothin' with old Misty's when she got good and mad. My new Mars ter want lack my own white folks. So I up and run way and joined the Yankee army and got a job workin' fair a captain named Esserton, or some pen like that, him and a lieutenant somebody. We followed General Sherman clear to Atlanta and ten mile futter on, then they turned back, and marched clear back to Chattanooga and then kept on till we got to Nashville. I show, was glad to get away from Atlanta, cause day was dead men evy way you looked at her day quit fightin'. Day gimme a uniform, but I didn't get no gun, I fought with a frying pan. We stayed in Nashville a while and when the war was over, Captain Esserton wanted to take me to Illinois with him and give me a job, but I didn't lack the Yankees. They wanted you to wook all the time, and that something I hadn't been brung up to do. They turned me free and I went with a passel of General Lee's soldiers, what come along going home and us went down and crossed the Biggies River I eber seed. I tuck up on fuss one farm and den another, till I found one I lack and den dat was two years adder we left Nashville, 1867, and I stayed dark close to Baton Rouge sixteen years. Laud, the cotton and sugar cane us did mech on dat rich lawn. 
It's richer and the Guana Day sells out here in Alabama. I went to Memphis on a excursion and stayed dar, doing fuss one thing and then another, sep get in jail, and I worked at a house painter's trade. I hear day paid good wages fair painting in Birmingham and I come here the same year all dem niggers was killed in dat church stompede. I got a job with Mr. Douglas, janitor and at the Jefferson Theater and him and me stayed together three years. I bought a wagon and sold kerosene oil fair about a year, till my money was all gone and then I got a job with the Baseball Association in the year 1913. I been with them ever since. I used to make fun $8 to $15 a week, cordon to how times was, tell the press I on come and ISE too old to work now, so I just totes the mail and does odd jobs and day pays me $3 a week fair dat. I applied fair old age pension two years back, but it hain't come yet. I got one boy livin' in Bummingham. He's forty year old, but he don't help me nary cent. My fuss wife died in Louisiana and I married a gal in Memphis, but she left me when I lost my job one time and went to Detroit with a passel of niggers. She ain't never writ back to me and I done quit paying her any mind. Sepen the room it is, ISE in good health and gets around pretty good. Ole Misty's showed me how to read print and I ain't never forget how. The Yankees didn't know dat I could read, and I never did let on. I can see pretty well but have to put on my glasses to read the print. Show. ISE gwine to live to be a hundred years old. How many mo years I got to go? Ten. That's right. I know ISE good fare this year, cause I allus noticed dat EF I live trough March, I lives all the rest OB the year. Interview with John Smith. Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. Mad bout sumpin', so they had a war. John Smith is 103 but he doesn't want to be tied down. F and I's free, I wants to joy it, John says, and he lives up to his desire. Though he is a war veteran, with bullets in his side and leg and his century of life has enfeebled him, he roams the countryside about Uniontown continually, set in a spell with his acquaintances. It was only after several trips I finally caught him, set in, and he showed no inclination to move from his advantageous position near a watermelon patch. He was industriously working on a huge slice of melon, his face buried in the sweet fruit, as I drove up to the little cabin where he was visiting. As the car came to a stop he raised his head and wiped his dripping chin on his sleeve. He called to a little negro girl in the yard, Gal, go bring the white lady a rockin' cheer, and turning to me he said, you'll, excuse me for not gettin' up lack I ain't got no manners, won't you miss Tess? I got a misery in my leg. You know the one war I got shot in the war. The rocking chair was brought out and taking a seat nearby I said, Uncle John, I want you to tell me all about yourself, were you in the war and are you really a hundred and three years old? Glad to, glad to Miss Tess, but fuss don't you want a watermelon? He pointed to a patch nearby where the melons glistened in the sun. This July sun make the juice so sweet you'll smack yo, mouth for mo, and searching the rind to see that he had left none of the juicy red meat, Uncle John began his story. Well, I been livin' ruin these parts bout ninety year. I was born somewhere in North Sierra I don't remember much bout my mammy and pappy cause I was took away from dem by the speculators when I was bout thirteen year old. The speculators raised niggers to sell. They would feed em up and get em fat and slick and make money on em. I was sold off the block in Speculators Grove in North Sierra the first day I was put up I didn't sold, but the next day I brung a thousand dollars. Mr. Sadler Smith from Selma bought me. They called him Sadler Smith cause he was in the saddle business and made saddles for the army. They fought us down on boats. I remember the song the men on the boat singed. Hit go like this. Up and down the mobile river. Two speculators for one puff lil nigger. My Mars tur was the best in this country. He didn't have many niggers, but he showed tuck good care o' oh, dem what he did had. 
he didn't loan nobody to hit Emma Lick. Sometime when I would get caught up with in some diverment the white folks would say, whose nigger is you, and I say, Ma Sadler Smith. Then they look at each other and say kinder low, better not do nothing to old Smith's nigger. He'll raise the debil. I didn't had no mistis. My Mars tur was a widder. He raised me up work and ruin the saddle shop. I ain't never like to work now how, but don't tell nobody dat. I was bout twenty-seven year old when the war broke out. The old UNS was called out fust and the young UNS stayed home and practiced so they could shoot straight and kill a Yankee. Us practiced every Friday evening. Course I didn't know what they fightin' bout. I just know day was mad bout some pin. Adder while Marster's son Jim J. in the Federate Saugers and I went with him for to tote his knapsack, canteen and sitch like and to look at her him. That's when I got these here balls in my side and got a bullet in my leg, too. I was moving from the hawses to the back of the lines out the thick of the fight when, zip, a minute ball caught me right in the shoulder. Proudly John displayed the balls in his side and the scar on his leg. The old woman, at whose cabin John was visiting, interrupted the story several times. Finally he got tired of it and said, Shet yo, mouth, Oman, I don't need no hopey, this is grown folks talk, you don't know nothing, bout it, you wasn't even birth till two year, fo, the surrender. Now war was I at. I slept right by Marsa Jim's side. Sometime adder us done laid down and both of us be thinkin', bout home, Moss Jim say, John, I lack to have some chicken. I don't say nothin', I just ease up and, pull my hat down over my eyes and, slip out. Adder while I come back with a bunch o chickens crossed my shoulder. Next mornin' Moss Jim have nice brown chicken flow oddin', in gravy what I done cook for him. Us was fightin' on Blue Mountain when Moss Jim got killed. I looked and looked for him but I never did find him. Adder I lost my Mars tur I didn't long to nobody and the Yankees was tuckin' evy thing anyhow, so they tuck me with dem. I tuck care of Jen L. Wilson's hawes, Jen L. Wilson was the head man in the Yankee army. But I didn't lack day ways much. He wanted his hawes kept spick and span. He would take his white pocket handkerchief and rub over the hawes and if it was dirty he had me whooped. I was with Jen L. Wilson when he tucked Selma, Jin's Jen L. Forest and sought fire to all them things. I drive the artillery wagon sometime. At her surrender I was kinda puny with the balls in my side. John, I asked, why didn't they remove the balls at the time you were shot? How could they move the balls when I was running fast as I could pick up my foots? I drive the stagecoach twixt Selma and Montgomery. I remember my stops. Day was Selma, Benton, Lownesboro and Montgomery. I drive four hawses to it. Deer was a Libyary stable at Benton and I changed hawses deer. Now John tell me about your wife and children, I said. How many children did you have? God, I don't know Miss Tess. They run and ruin the country like hogs. They don't know me and I don't know them. I ain't never been mied. Niggers didn't marry in dem days. I just tuck up with one likely gal at her anoder. I ain't even my to the one I got now. I just ain't gwine tie myself down. F and eyes free, eyes gwine to be free. Uncle John sat for a time in deep thought, then said, I wish I might be back in dem days, cause I been seed the debil since I been free. Adder I was free I didn't had no Mars tur to pend on and I was hungry a heap of times. I long to the Federate Nation and always will long to y'all, but I reckon it's just as well we is free cause I don't believe the white folks nowadays would make good Marsters. Uncle John had about talked out and as I rose to leave I said, thank you John, this will make a good story, to which he replied indignantly, it ain't no story. Hits the God's truth Miss Tess. Personal Interview with Aunt Annie Stanton Rylands Lane, Mobile, Alabama Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama Out on Rylands Lane is an old Negro woman 84 years of age who is totally blind, 
but whose mind is clear in regards to things pertaining to the long ago. Aunt Annie says that things that happened when she was a child are much more vivid in her mind than are things of today. She said, sometimes I now starts to do dumpin' and forgets what I wants to do, then I ahs to go bac, to the place war I started from so I kin, member what I started to do. Aunt Annie was born on Knight's Place on the Alabama River, June 2, 1853. This place is now known as Finchburg, in Monroe County, Alabama. Her mother's name was Mary Knight and her father's name was Atlas Williams, who had the same name as his owner, Mr. Offord Williams. Aunt Annie's mother's people were owned first by Mr. Cullen Knight and after his death, were owned by Mr. John Marshall. Aunt Annie was seven years old then the Civil War started, and that she had nursed two colored children afore the war. When asked by the writer about nursing these children, so as to be sure she said colored children, she replied, that the slaves lived on the plantation, and they had an overseer who lived on this place. And, she never seed the marshal's place, till after day was freed. As I growed bigger into a big yearlin' gal I was tuck into the overseer's home to, tend to the dining room table sitch a set tin, hidden, washin' the dishes and cleanin' up, and later on I was showed how to iron, spin thread, weave cloth. And make candles. Honey, folks talkin' about depression now don't know nothin' about hard times. In dem days folks didn't have nothin' exceptin' what they made. Eben if yo had a mint ob money, dear was nothin' to buy. We made the candles to burn by tying strings on the stick and puttin' dem down in melted tallow in molds. In dem times we had no matches, folks made fire by strikin' flint rocks together and the fire droppin' on cotton. I don't know whether these rocks were ones that the Indians left or no, but they was different from other rocks. People USTA carry them in the cotton rune in boxes something like snuff boxes to keep the cotton dry. Sometimes when they could NT get the fire no other way, they would put the cotton in the fireplace and shoot up in deer and set it on fire. Aunt Annie said she never could start a fire with the flint rock and cotton, and she said, the fust matches and lantern ISE Eber seed was when the Yankees come to Deer Place, I teach o today was two officers, cows day had the matches and lantern. Two years later I was freed, and toward den I seed my first lamp. The men did mows ob the farm work, they planted cotton, corn, potatoes, cane, peas and pumpkins, and they gin the cotton by hitching four horses to the gin, and they run hit that way. When asked if they had plenty to eat when they were slaves, Aunt Annie said. Lore, yes I guess we had, enough, but, turnt much. C.A.S.E.I., members when we was lil chillin we had a big wooden tray dat day put the food in and we all sat round dat and eat like lil pigs. The rations for a week was three pounds of meat a week, one peck ob meal, potatoes and syrup. At Christmas times the overseer called all the men and women in and give each woman a dress, a head handkerchief, and to the men he gave a hat, knife, and a bottle of whiskey. The overseer also gave to us flour and sugar fo Christmas, and I, members one Christmas when I was a lil gal, ater the overseer give all the women a dress dear was a short piece ob cloth left, and he give that to me. Aunt Annie said that the slaves went to the white folks' church, and sat on the seats on the outside ob the church, and that church was a huge log building. After the white folks got through preaching, then the colored preacher would preach. Sometimes the colored folks would have church when the white folks didn't and then the slaves would have to get a pass from his owner, C.A.S.E. Deer would be some mean folks what would beat the niggers E.F. they didn't have a pass from deer owners or bosses. Aunt Annie also said, I.S.E. never heard of no hoodoo stuff till in late years, days imo ob dat foolishness now dan I.S.E. ebier heard of in my life. Nowadays the hoodoo's doctors, what is a loser going round foolin' folks out ob day money, looks like the dogs might ob and dem, they is so terrible looking. I don't believes in dem. Us folks a long time ago never have no money fo dem to get. Us had to make own medicine. 
When the babies had the colic us would tie soot up in a rag and boil it, and then give them the water, and to ease the prickly heat us used cotton would powdered up fine, and fo the yellow thrash us would boil the sheep thrash and give em the tea. Aunt Annie has been married twice, her first husband left her years ago, when she married Louis Stanton and had five children by him. Louis was killed in a hailstorm, April 13, 1903, and all of her children are dead. She is now being cared for by friends, and she said, that EFIs didn't get a lil heepee from the government to give this friend, she didn't know what she would do as she has been totally blind for two years. Interview with Theodore Fontaine Stewart Gertha Couric, H.W., Ufala. U.S. Gwine VR Walk Dem Gold Streets The years are mighty long without Lottie, Massa. She done gone on to the promise, but I know she would Jesus. And us gwine, er walk dem golden streets together holden hands. Uncle Theodore Fontaine Stewart lives alone in a weather-beaten, one-room Ufala shanty. It is clean and surrounded by flowers. In the rear is a small garden. And there you will find Uncle Stewart and the dawn is fresh or the dusk is coolly approaching. Lottie been gone away nigh on to twenty-two year now, Massa. Her was a good woman, one of the best the Lord ever sent to the earth. He paused to think when the interviewer asked his age. It hard fair me to tell, bout dat, he said, but I knows ISE well past the ninety mark. I guess ISE gwine on a hundred, case I was born for the war and was a right pert boy at the surrender. What about slavery times, Uncle Stewart? He mused a moment, his black fingers gently caressing the buttons on his rust-colored old vest. I members all about dem times, he said, and the Lord no day was better times den we got now, for white or black. Nobody was hungry den, Massa, and peoples didn't get in the devilment they gets in now. Folks went to the church and have themselves in those days. Who was my old master? He looked at the interviewer a moment, answered proudly, why, he was the richest man in Georgie. I knows you has heard of Moss Theodore Fontaine. He had three big plantations and mo niggers dan he could count. He moved close to Florence, and his three places was so big you couldn't see, crossed the littlest field. Old Marster he live in a big house, bigger dan any meetin' house in Ufala. He had a gang of fine horses, and when company was dar he had horse races on his own track. His horses could beat all the horses brought dar, and that's the direct truth. Uncle Stewart filled a blackened old corn cob pipe with tobacco, continued. Old Mars Tur, he didn't go to the war. He too old to go, so he stay home and make corn and fodder and oats and send dem to the soldiers what killin' Yankees. One day the Yankees come along and burnt up everything on the place, cept the nigger cabins. They took all the horses and everything us had to eat. Old Marster went off somewhere when day come, I don't remember where. And when he come back he had to live in one of the nigger cabins, twelve he could build a house. But the new one wasn't big lack the old one. My pappy was a fiel, Han, twelve one time old Marster put him on a horse to ride in a race, and pappy beat the other horse so far old Marster was tickled pink. He said a nigger what could ride lack dat had no business in the fiel, so he made a stable boy out in pappy. Theodore Fontaine Stewart, Eufaula, Alabama. Old Marster didn't have no old mistis. He say he so big all the little ladies look funny, side of him. When company was dar his sisters, Mistis Mary and Mistis Lucy, come and kept house, but they left when the company did. My pappy was named Ed Stewart, case old Marster by him from a Stewart. Adder de war day call pappy's chillin' Stewart, but us is Fontaine's by right, Bet yo life on dat. Old Marster was good to the niggers, but his overseers was mean. Old Marster fired dem at her a while and got some good overseers. He didn't load dem to whip a nigger, cept when he say, and he didn't say so much. My mammy was named Sarah, and her and Pappy stayed right with Old Marster when the surrender come. Day was right in the room when Old Marster died, and Day cried something awful. Us all stayed dar, twelve pappy and mammy die, 
then us chillin split up and went everywhere. Mammy and Pappy had ten head o oh, chillin sides me, but I don no war day it now. Mammy raise all her chillins right, and long as I know dem, none of dem ever got in a jailhouse. Mammy didn't low her chillins to steal. Her was old master's house cook, and when she caught any of us taqueen things from the kitchen, she show did tan us hides with a brush. Me and Carlotta, us calls her Lottie. Was married in the old Mount Maria church, where all the niggers went to meetin' every Sunday. Us had F.O. chillin', two gals and two boys, but they all dead now, cept a lost boy, and I ain't heard from him since, for his mammy died. Yes, Massa, her was a good woman. It won't be long now, for us will walk dem Golden Streets Han, in Han, dot. Interview with George Strickland. Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. Corn shuckin was the greets thing. George Strickland. Alert for all his ninety-one years but blinking in the bright sunlight as he laid his battered felt hat beside the rocking chair in front of his cabin in Opelika, Alabama. As he looked back down the decades and remembered the times when corn shuckin was the greets thing. Though only a boy when the war between the states ended, he recalled days of slavery easily as he told the following story. I was nine years old when us niggers was sought free in F.O. that time us refugeed from Mississippi to Mobile, then to Selma, then to Montgomery and from Dar to Uchi, near Columbus, Georgia, where we stayed till us was freed. My mammy and daddy come from Mississippi fust. Day was Cleveland and Eve Strickland and Dar was F.O. of us chillins, Will, Sam, Missouri and me. Us quarters had dirt flows and was in two long rows with a street between. On the east side of the settlement was the barns, shops and sitch like. The beds was boxed up and nailed to the wall, then day was filled with pine straw. They fed us lil niggers in wood troughs made of poplar. The cook in the big house cooked pots of greens and pid pot liquor and all in the troughs. Us eaty hit with mussel shells or with us as hans or gourds. Our vinmin folks would bile the gourds to keep them from being bitter. Uses had two acre pasture dat uses would turn under in the fall and plant hit in turnips. I, Claire F.O., goodness day growed nearly as big as a gallon bucket. They give the CLOES every Saturday night and the winter CLOES had some cow hair in them to make them warm. Old Marsa John Strickland was circuit preacher and him and Miss Polly lived up in a big log house. The logs was hewed and split and lined on each side. The logs stood on day sides and didn't lay flat. Day chillins was Mary, Laura, Sally, Wiley, George and Blue Jean. When O Marsa went off to preach, the overseer was mean and whooped the niggers so bad misties run him off. Day had about a hundred slaves and would wake them up by beating on a big piece of sheet iron -E, iron, with a long piece of steel. The well didn't have no windlass but had a lever with a bucket fastened on one end of hit, and we would hold to the other end to dip the bucket in the water. When they whooped the niggers they would tie them to a tree and whoop them good. When they was sold they would put em on a stand or block, as they called hit den, and they wud roll up they sleeves to see the muscles. Then they bid on them and bought em for about $1,000 to $1,500 apiece. Us traveled in ox carts, and I fussed rid on a stage when I went to Uchi. When slaves would be ver, bad day would chain them out all night. You show, had to stay at home and wook. Our chu ch was nearby and bus sought next to the do. Misty's called up all the lil niggers, talked to them and had PRR. The others had PRR meetin' once at a week. The Vimmin folks had a big time quiltins with somebody a playin' on old gourds with horse hair strings, called Old Gourd, Horse Hair Dance. Corn shuckin was the greets thing of all. Old Marsa tuck a jug of liquor rune and got dem tighten, when they got full day would hist him up and down, toed him rune and holler. Then the fun started and they would play the Old Gourd and Horse Hair Dance, the Hansaw and Case Knife. They could run day han up and down the saw to change the tune and the leader was on top of the pile of corn singing whilst all the others would follow. 
Us chillins was sleep den, but us had our good times hiding, de switchin', playin', Hanover ball. Day show skeer us nearly into fits with tales of rawhead and bloody bones. I see never tuck a oath net tetched nothing didn't belong to me in all my life. Our med cin was Jerusalem oak seed what was beat up to give to chillins for worms. On Sunday morning they give us biscuits for breakfast, which was so rare that we would try to beat the others out in day in. Once it day piled everything on wagons and put all us lil niggers on top. Us rations, lack coffee, meal, meat and mo's everything was kivered over with sheets. Den day tuck us off and us stayed teary days and nights. Ol' Marsa tuck one of the fellers with him to be on the front line to help keep off the engines, so us chillins be leaves. George Strickland, Opelika, Alabama. Dat Battle of Atlanta was the worst thing dat's ever been. All the houses for a fur piece just shuck from the big guns. The Yankees camped in a big hundred-acre fiel close by. Den they rushed up to the house, kicked the gate down, tuck missed his trunk out and bus hit open hunting money. But they found none, so they sought fire to the house and A.S.T. wore the horses. The niggers couldn't tell and den they burnt the house down. Adder dat, ol' Marsa tell us, us is free from him but needn't leave if and us didn't want to go, but could stay on with him and he'd treat us right and give us half of what us made. In after years I mod Josephine Bedell and us had George, Philip, Renza, Eldridge, the baby, May Willie and Layla. I's got some grandchildren, too, but can't think of day names. It was the plans of God to free us niggers and not Abraham Lincoln's. I's a lose tried to live under the correction of the Lord. It's my duty to try to do so. Personal Interview with Cole Taylor 364, North Scott Street, Mobile, Alabama Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama A slave is given his young missy's name. A tall, stoop-shouldered, black negro man came trudging down the road with a hoe in his hand. Asked where Cole Taylor lived, the old man said, Lady I.S.E. Cole Taylor. This is my house here. Does you want to see me? When told that his visitor was looking for old people who lived during slavery days Cole said. I were born a slave, but warned very old when the niggers was freed. I were born March 5, 1859, in Augusta County, Alabama. Ma ma come from Richmond, Virginia and her name were Jane Hare. Ma pa's name were Willingham Hare, and he were brought to Alabama from North Carolina. I guess U.S.E. wondering why my name is Taylor when my ma's and pa's name was Hare. You see when day was fust brought here, a man named Tom Taylor bought M, and when I were born, they give me to Miss Benny Taylor. Oh ma's Tom's girl. Miss Benny give me the name Taylor and I.S.E. Alus kept it. She surely was good to me. I never had nothing much to do, I stayed with her, till I was grown, at her she married Mr. Bob Alexander. Bout de war, I does, member how my ma was a weaving cloth when the Yankees come through. And adder de niggers was freed ol' Moss Tom gib my ma de loom. Ol' Moss was a good man. He never load no o seer or anybody to mistreat his niggers. He had plenty of m, too, and a big plantation with plenty to eat. Course the slaves had to work on the plantation and raise the stuff to eat. His house was a big fine, white place, and the cabins where the slaves lived was built in rows, with streets between them, so you could drive tween em with big double-team wagons. The cabins was built out ob logs with a notch out in the shoulders, and laid on top ob one another and when they built the wall up as high as they wanted hit, they would bore a ogier hole and put a pin in hit to hold them together. Then they put the roof on. They filled the cracks between the logs with mortar, so as to keep the wind out, and it show made the houses warm. Us had Jess wooden homemade beds, with mattresses made of cotton, or moss, and sometimes hay. Us never have no springs on the beds. As I said, old Moss Tom was a good man, and he was too old to go to the war, but he had two boys. The oldest one went to the war and was killed. 
but the youngest weren't old enough to go. Old Ma's Tom had the women sew, making clothes, and had nurse women to look at her the little niggers while dear Ma's was in the fields. I, members as a lil boy how they had one house where the nurse kept the chillin' in, it was as clean as a pin. Dear was wooden troughs different heights for the different age chillin', and those troughs was scrubbed as white as cotton mows. When meal time come, they would crumble up cornbread with pot liquor, or milk and give to the youngest ones. And they had plenty ob milk, I, members the big milk dairy, and smoke house on the place, and when the Yankees come through they went into the dairy and drank all the milk they wanted. I, members my pa was out in the woods hiding the mules when they come through and deer was only one old horse on the place. Them Yankees turn hit loose, but otherwise they behaved very nice. Cull said that they didn't know anything about dishes and spoons such as are used now, for they had wooden spoons for the slaves. He said that the usual rations for a week included a peck of meal, and six or seven pounds of meat to each man, and if he had a big family he was given more. They raised rice, sugar cane, pumpkins, watermelons, cashaws, peaches, pears, plums, and grapes. Ma white folks not only took cure ob us during slavery times, but they give us things adder us was freed. You ax me bout the slaves' clothes. Yes em, lady, us had good, stout, clothes, made out ob the cloth dat the women wove. I can see my ma throwing dat old shickle from one side to the other, weaving cloth on dat loom. They dyed the cloth with red oaks and dogwood bark and chinaberry bark, and had all kinds ob colors, such as blue, red, brown, and black. Then dear was the big times, such as the hog killin' time, and corn shucking, and specially cotton pickin' time. Sometimes the neighboring plantation would have a regular cotton pickin' festival, and all OBS would go and he pee pick the cotton, and the nigger what would pick the mows would get a dress or the men would get a suit OB clothes. The suits was made out OB osnabug, and sometimes bed tickin'. When a big crowd would come to these cotton pickings, they would pick out three or four bales ob cotton. The lil niggers had a good time playin' in the sand makin' frog houses and spinnin' tops. But, lordy! When us got sick, they give us Jerusalem oak and sassafras tea. But never was dear anything said bout hoodoo stuff. I never heard ob hit, till these later years. But us did have church, and prayer meetin', and funerals. Lore, yes, they don't bury folks now. In those days they started singin' at the house and sung all the way to the graveyard. And then they put them in the ground good full six feet deep, they just lays folks on top o' be the ground nowadays. But times is different now, lady. I, members how the men would go out nights and hunt the possums and the coons and wild cats. They then would sometimes go deer and rabbit hunting in the daytime, and, too, they would set traps to catch other varmints. Deer was plenty ob squirrels too. But let me tell you, the best thing ob all was the good locust beer they made from locust seeds. They also made simon beer and wine out ob plums. Dem war good days den. Interview with Daniel Taylor. Montgomery, Alabama. John Proctor Mills, Montgomery, Alabama. Forward, in Uncle Daniel Taylor we find the unusual. Fast disappearing type of Negro ex-slave, it makes the sentimental white man feel a deep sadness in the passing of these gentle old souls, whose lives have been well spent in serving to the best of their ability. Uncle Dan is a light-complected mulatto, octoroon, with a high and broad forehead, a noble brow, devoid of all negroid features, a heavy suit of silk-like hair almost free of any kinks. A heavy suit of gray beard, it is in the short kinky hair next to his throat that the negro stands out most prominently, a fine mustache which matches the snowy silkiness of his hair up on his head. Deep-set, dark blue-gray eyes which beam with kindliness, wide apart and far-searching. A voice well modulated and refined in timbre, of tenor quality. Uncle Dan has been so closely associated with the educated white man of the South until he uses no Negro dialect, 
but his speech is that of one who has tried at all times to speak correctly and deliberately. He has served as janitor at nearly all of the public schools of the Montgomery City School System, and for 15 years or more has been at the Baldwin High School. Is janitor at this school at present, May 1937, where he is highly respected, and greatly beloved by the student body and members of the large faculty. Strange to say, I do not remember the name of my first master, nor of the second master to whom my mother and myself were sold to in Alabama. I was born at Charleston, South Carolina, and at the age of two and a half years we landed at Louvern, Alabama, where with my mother I was sold for $400. I was 14 years old at the time of the surrender, and was living at Old Rocky Mount, in Crenshaw County, at the time of the Civil War. Professor Mac Barnes of Highland Home, Alabama, was the first man I ever worked for, and he, as you know, was at the head of the large school located in Highland Home. The hottest moments of my life were the ones in which my mother got tied in behind me with a hickory, switch, and I always took to the woods. I'll just bet that I knew and could tell more about the woods and the cane break than anyone in that section. Yes sir. I knew every varmint that crawled on its belly, and all the rest which went on four feet, that lived there. Believe me, I knew every one of them by name and right where they stayed. The hot moments just mentioned usually found me cooling off in the creek in the old swimming hole. Daniel Taylor, Montgomery, Alabama Among the thrilling moments of my life well do I remember the visits of President Jefferson Davis, the first and only President of the Confederate States of America, to the home of my master. Mr. Davis always gave me a quarter of a dollar for holding his horse, and up, till lately I had one of those quarters as a highly valued keepsake, but it suddenly disappeared, I know not where. The most exciting moments of my whole life was when the Heron Street School, at present the Cottage Hill School, caught fire and burned to the ground. We had marched all of the children out of the building to safety, you see we had all had disciplined fire drills, but Professor Charles L. Floyd, superintendent of the Montgomery Public Schools, was mindful lest there should still be one person left in the building, so hastened back into the rapidly burning building. He just wouldn't listen to the pleadings of Miss Ginny, Miss Virginia Herford, who was the principal of this school, nor to Miss Sophie, Miss Sophia Holmes, a teacher at the primary department, nor would he listen to my humble plea. The roof was already tumbling in, and the blazing rafters were falling in every direction. I could stand it no longer, so rushed right through the smoke and flames, finally I found Mr. Floyd and dragged him out to safety. My God! I loved that white man, he was one of the finest men I ever knew. No! Mr. John, I have never sought a, Harrow's medal for bravery and for risking my life, my one great reward was in the saving of the life of my true friend Professor Charles L. Floyd. Personal Interview with George Taylor. 409, South Hamilton Street, Mobile, Alabama. Isla B. Prine, Mobile, Alabama. Chillin was taught to be mannerable. George Taylor, an old and very black man, who lives at 409, South Hamilton Street in Mobile, says he is an ex-slave. He knows that he was born in Mobile on the corner of Cedar and Texas Streets, but left Mobile, and was carried to Gosport, Alabama, when he was twelve years old. His father's name was Gus Taylor and his mother's Sarah Taylor, and they were owned by Mr. W. G. Heron. There were twenty-one children in George's family, and he said he was the oldest one, and helped Nus to Otters. My grandfather's name was Mac Wilson and my grandmother's name was Ellen Wilson, and the old Miss's name was Miss Mamie Heron. All the colored folks chillin called Mr. Heron C.L. Mars Tur, and he show was a good Mars Tur, too. I, members dat adder I got to be a big boy day put me in de fiel's choppin' cotton, but I never could pick cotton. I knows dat my pa said I was too crazy bout de girls, so he tuck me in, made me plow. Old Marster had a big place, I don't just exactly knows how many acres day was, but I knows us had plenty ob cotton, c-a-s-e sometimes day would pick four or five bales a day. And, den I knows during cotton time my pa hauled cotton all day long to the gin what was run by five or six mules. 
During the busy season on the plantation Ole Marster had the older women cooking and sending the dinner to the fiel. Deer was two big baskets, one to put the bread in, and had a otter basket to put the meat in. Every morning at three o'clock the women begun cooking and each Han brought his own meat and bread to this cabin to be cooked. Every person's plate had their names on them. Everybody had to be up by daylight and ready to begin work. The men had to get up before daylight and begin to harness the mules, and soon as light day was in the fiels. Deer was 250 head OB colored people, excusing chillin. They would raise four, five, and six hundred bales OB cotton, a year. Us worked den, deer weren't no walkin' bout den, not even on Saturday afternoons, but I believes I'd lack it better than I does now, cause the chillin was taught to be mannerable den, but now day cuss if you say anything to dem. Us had a good place to stay, the old master's house was a big two-story house, and our cabins was built OB boards and was in a row. Us didn't have no stoves, just cooked out in the yard over a fire with stakes on each side of it, with an iron bar across M to hang the pots on. Old Marster rationed out the food, and each man was load seven pounds OB meat, the women was load six pounds and five pounds for each child. Then they give us a peck OB meal, five pounds of flour and some molasses. I never did eat at home with my folks, C.A.S.E. I nussed in the big house, and every time that the white chillin' eat, I had to eat, too. Deer was plenty O.B. pecan, walnut, and cheese nut trees on the place, and us could eat all the nuts we wanted. And then the slaves had their own gardens if they wanted to. Then I, members how deer was four men who put the hogs in the pens to fatten, Sometimes, they would put as many as a hundred or a hundred and fifty at a time. Then it was dear duty to tote feed from the fiels to feed M. My. When I think O.B. dat big smoke house, my mouth jess waters. At hog killin, time, dear was certain men to kill, and certain ones to cut M up. Dear weren't never no special time to hog killin, jess when the old marster said do hit, we did hit. You see us was a lose under his direction, C.A.S.E. if us wanted to go anywhere, us had to get a pass, Eben to church. The white folks had Methodist church, and the colored had the Baptist church. I also, members the time I was put up on the block to be sold, and, when the man only offered five hundred dollars, fair me, and old Marster told me to get down, that I was the most valuable nigger he had, C.A.S.E. I was so strong. And, could do so muck work. Mama was the weaver, and dear was a woman named Asella who did the dyeing. Ma pa gathered the bark, sitch as red oak, elm, maple and juniper bark, and dry hit and den grin hit up. They also used borax, alum and blue stone, to set the dye. The women made the clothes out ob disc cloth that was woven on the place. You axed about weddings. Us didn't have weddings like us do now. The way us married would be to go to the big house, and old Marster had us to jump over a broomstick, and then us was considered married. But dear was one thing that us weren't load to do, and that was to abuse or cuss our wives, and you better not strike M, C-A-S-E hit would be just too bad. You know, miss, I see been here a long time. I, members when dear was only one house, tweenesty. Lewis Street and Frascotti and that was the guard house. I also remembers the old-time remedies that day used in the old days. They used red oak bark for fever and colds, and den deer was whorehound, and black snake root that the old marster put whiskey on. Old marster made his own whiskey. And, oh. Yes, the calamus root growed in the woods where they lived. I never seed them sent to no store for medicine. I never heard OB no hoodoo stuff, till I was grown, and another thing folks didn't die of lack they do now. When anyone did die, they a lose had a big funeral, and the men would sometimes hitch up a ox team or mule teams, and as many as could get in would go. The coffins was homemade and stained. Deer was plenty OB Hans to dig the graves, too. I see tell you, miss, folks is pretty much the same, if the white folks treat the niggers right, 
you couldn't get them to leave them. I, members when the Yankees come through, I was standin' on the old Marster's porch, and I see them coming, and Marster got up on his crutch and go to the steps and invite them in, and believe me they come in, too. They just naturally tore up old Marster's place, then the furniture all ruined and broke heaps o' be hit. I knows before they got dear old Marster had my pa, and Jerry Lee, and Mace Pouncey, and another man take four barrels o' be money and carry down to the spring and put hit in the spring, and I see tellin' you, miss. You couldn't any more get near dat spring, dan nothin', C.A.S.E. the quicksand made dem barrels boil up, one at a time, and the way they had to get dem barrels, was to build a scaffold from the river, and let a line down and catch around dem barrels. Atta we was freed, old Marster come out in the yard and got in the middle o.b. all o.b. us, and told us dat the ones dat wants to stay with him, to stand, on one side, and the otters to stand, on the other side. So my pa got on the side with those who wanted to leave, and us left, old Mars turn paddled down the river, in a paddling, boat to Bell's Landing. As I.S.E. said before, I.S.E. been here a long time, I ebbent members seeing Jeff Davis. I knows I ain't here for long, but I.S.E. ready, C.A.S.E. I.S.E. been fightin' for Jesus twenty-nine years, and I ain't tired o' be fightin', yet. I.S.E. a deacon in the Baptist Church. Personal interview with Amanda Tellis. And her daughter Sarah Chastan. In Allenville, Mobile County, Alabama. Written by Isla B. Prime. Amanda Tellis, a tall, thin, light Lolata woman, who was born a slave November 30, 1854, lives in Allenville, a Negro settlement about four miles north of Mobile, Alabama. Amanda's father was a Spaniard, whose name was John Quick and her mother's name was Sally Pugh, her mother having the same name as the people who owned her. Sally, Amanda's mother, was born a slave in Charleston, South Carolina, and she and her mother were brought to Alabama and sold when Sally was twelve years old. The mother was sold to someone in Demopolis, Alabama, while Sally was sold to the Pugh family in Grove Hill, Alabama. Amanda was born in Grove Hill, Alabama and Mr. Meredith Pugh was her master, and Mrs. Fanny Pugh was her mistress. Her young missus was Miss Maria Pugh, a daughter, one of seven children in the Pugh family. Amanda said she willed to Miss Maria, and she nursed and took care of her until the surrender. Many times when Amanda would be promised a whipping for not doing things as she should have, Miss Maria would save her from the whipping, by throwing herself back from the table and screaming for them not to touch Amanda, her nurse. Aside from caring for Miss Maria, Amanda said she spun three cuts of thread a day, and when the writer asked what a cut was, she said, a cut was a brooch full. During the war, meaning the Civil War, Amanda said she and her sister Nancy spun 160 yards of cloth, and they finished the last on the day of the surrender, when the cannons were fired at Fort Morgan, and they were mustering the men out. Amanda's life was a very easy one in comparison to some of the other slaves. She said she had seen many of the slaves cruelly mistreated, but her people were fortunate in having a good master and mistress. However, at the close of the war, Amanda was told to pretend she had a chill, and go to her mother's cabin, so she did as she was told. When she reached the cabin, her mother, brothers and sisters each had a pillow slip, filled with clothes and she was given hers and they ran away, and came to M. Vernon, Alabama. Amanda was only eleven years old then. Her life has been varied since, having married three times. Her first husband was Scott Johnson, and was the father of all of her children, seven boys and one girl. Amanda lives with this girl now. Her second husband was Vance Stokes, and her third was St. Tellis, a Negro Methodist preacher. Amanda said he was, no count and I did not stay with him long. Amanda is now confined to her bed and has been for the past seven weeks, her body has wasted away, until she is skin and bones. Her eyes however are still bright and keen, her hair snow white and she still has a few teeth. Her mind seems to be clear, and her memory good, in fact the past is now a part of her, and she told the writer she was so happy because she had come to ask her about it, before it was too late. Interview with Ellen Thomas Mary A. 
Pool, Mobile. Table service as taught to Aunt Ellen. In a little cottage at 310 Weenacker Avenue, in the western part of Mobile, lives Ellen Thomas, who claims to be 89 years old. She is small of stature, dark brown in color, with high cheekbones and small regular features. Although she wears the old-fashioned bandana handkerchief bound about her head, the story of Aunt Ellen is unusual, in that having been raised as a house servant in a cultured southern family. She absorbed or was trained in the use of correct speech, and does not employ the dialect common to Negroes of the slavery days. Aunt Ellen was born in Mobile. Her mother, Emmeline, was a dwarf who was brought from St. Louis to Mobile by a slave trader. When put up for sale, her deformity enlisted the sympathy of Judge F.G. Kimball, who bought her and brought her to his home on Dauphin Street, between Hallett Street and Georgia Avenue. Later, Sam Brown, a free Negro from the West Indies, came to Mobile and, wanting Emmeline for his wife, agreed to pay Judge Kimball for her, giving himself as security. Sam and Emmeline had only two children, Pedro and Ellen, both born on Judge Kimball's place and raised in his home as house servants, having little contact with the field slaves. In her childhood, Ellen had as her special mistress Miss Cornelia, one of the Kimball girls, who trained her in the arts of good housekeeping, including fine sewing, which was itself an art among the women of that period. Ellen relates with much pride, her ability to put in tucks and backstitch them in the front of men's shirts, to equal the best machine work of the present day. Although hampered by failing eyesight in recent years, her work with the needle today is proof that her claims are not exaggerated. In all her experience as a slave, she recalls but one whipping. This was with a small switch in the hands of Judge Kimball. The cause? She answered, I ain't coming, when he called her, and at his second call, she said, I shan't do it. She was seven years old at the time. Judge Kimball insisted that the house servants use good English, she said. Thus brought up as a child among the Kimball children, and because of her duties as a house servant, she mingled little with the field hands and acquired none of their dialect. Even her long association with free Negroes since the war, has failed to eradicate early impressions and practices in the use of words, and she stresses this in conversation with educated white persons. Because she was a house servant, Ellen was accorded many privileges not enjoyed by ordinary slaves. Good food, neat clothing and cleanliness of person were requirements rigidly enforced. As personal maid to young girls little older than herself, her lot was quiet and the association developed a devotion and friendship that was lifelong. Among the privileges that fell to her as a child, she recalls that of accompanying the family on carriage rides, usually seated beside the driver to the envy of her little mistress on the more dignified inside seat. Ellen Thomas, Mobile, Alabama her training as a house servant was very broad and involved every feature of a well-kept household of that period. She has a special pride in her ability to serve at table, particularly when there were guests present. A feature of the training given her and which Ellen says she never knew of anyone else receiving was, after being taught to set the dining table complete for guests. She would be blindfolded and then told to go through the motions of serving and so learn to do so without disturbing anything on the table. So proficient did she become in serving, that a few times when they had guests, Judge Kimball would for their amusement have Ellen blindfolded and direct her to serve the dinner. In passing dishes a small silver tray was used. Ellen said that they tried to teach her brother Pedro to serve the table likewise, but his natural clumsiness prevented. He could never learn. During the war, she said, her master had an immense pit dug near the house, put his cotton in the pit and built the woodpile over it. The federal invaders never found it. Judge Kimball owned extensive tracts of land above Mobile and used a large number of his slaves to cut timber for wood and lumber, hewn timber being largely used for house building. He built a house for every one of his children, from his own timber, and even had his own coffin made from homegrown cedar. Ellen failed to follow this act of her master with approval, judging from her tone in speaking of it. She remembers the surrender and the incidents accompanying that event. She was seventeen years old. Thus she describes the first visit afterward of the enemy. 
I was helping to cook breakfast one morning, frying codfish and potatoes, when I heard a drum and ran to tell master. He jumped up and said, it's the Yankees. Tell Pedro to get a sheet and hang it out in front. Pedro was excited and, instead of getting a sheet, got one of Mistress Best tablecloths and hung it from a big oak tree near the front gate. When the Yankees rode up, they dismounted and Master invited them in for breakfast. One of the Yankee lieutenants asked her name, and she told him, Ellen Brown. He looked puzzled at her answer, knowing her master's name to be Kimball. Since her father was a free man, Aunt Ellen said that she and her brother, Pedro, always retained their own name, instead of, Kimball. The lieutenant then said, All right, Ellen, bring me a glass of milk at thirteen o'clock. She went to her little mistress, and asked her what that old lieutenant meant by, thirteen o'clock. Miss Cornelia laughed and said he meant, one o'clock. Aunt Ellen related how Judge Kimball was always teaching them and gave them regular lectures. She particularly remembers one of his sayings, You can never swing on yellow pine tree, as it is tender and pliable. She remained with the Kimballs three years after the war, worked for other families a short time and then married Amos Thomas when she was about twenty years old. They had a very large family, eleven girls and nine boys. She now has great-grandchildren who are married. Although there is little doubt that her age is approximately what she claims, Aunt Ellen is remarkably well-preserved, physically and mentally. Her activity and industry would not be inappropriate to a woman a score of years younger. Unlike many persons of her years she does not constantly look forward to her time of departure, but takes life as it comes, caring more for today than for tomorrow. Interview with Elizabeth Thomas Montgomery Hid things they ain't never found Elizabeth Thomas who lives at 2, Eugene Street, Montgomery, Alabama stuck up one finger when asked her age. That meant 100 she said. She is typical the old-time Negro with head rag tightly covering her hair, carrying a slick old walking stick whose bark is worn in places because of constant use, and little old straight-cut full apron. Her memory is not clear but her hearing is perfect. She stated. I lived mighty fine in dem days, I tell you. Mr. Ben Martin Jones was my Mars tur, and I was born on the Red Bridge Road. I was a house servant. All our CLOES was made at the quarters. My mammy made mine and all I wanted, too. I used to hear my mammy say, the patrols, patrols, would get us EF we done wrong but I didn't know nothin' bout patrols cause day wasn't none on our place. Day whipped you, too, but my marster could control all his niggers so he didn't loan none UV M on our place. I was 21 years old when the Yankees come but I didn't run and they didn't do nothing to me but folks was in such a hurry they hid things that ain't never been found yet. I liked meetin' on Sundays and sometime we never got out of church till daylight. I wants to live just as long as Jesus say and when he say go, I is he ready. At Christmas times we always had good dinners and heap o oh, company, plenty uv it. My missus died and adder dat my mother raised old Marster's chili, Tommy John, right long with me. Oh, dem was happy days, I tell you. Interview with Molly Tillman. Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama. I warn't no common slave. Aunt Molly Tillman was fifteen years old when the southern slaves were freed. But despite her advanced age, she is able to work every day in the cotton fields and admits that she is pretty pert. She said, Honey, I can recollect all about slavery time, case I was a big old gal den. Why, I, members when the emancipation come as if tea was yes tidy. Aunt Molly recalls that she was born on a plantation near Rome, Georgia, and that her owners were Dan and Lucy Phillips. Moss Dan was a Baptist preacher, she explained, and, he surely was a good man. He was a chaplain in the big war and he didn't get hurt. Marster owned lots and lots of slaves and, and the plantation was Jess full o' niggers. He was a powerful important man. Honey, I warn't no common evide slave, I hope had the white folks in the big house. Mistis Lucy wouldn't let M take me to the fiel. 
Den was good days, chilly, might good days. I was happy den, but since emancipation I has just had to scuffle and work and do the best I can. Aunt Molly's hair is snow white in sharp contrast to her ginger cake skin. I remembers all about when the Yankees come, she said. Day was Jess ruination to the plantation. Day tuck all the mules and cows, then sought out and got all the chickens and eggs they could fin. Eaton was kind o oh, slack with us at her day left. Dot. Aunt Molly's life has known romance. Let her tell it. I was old enough to be cast in my eyes rune at the young bucks, and dear was a nigger what lived on the plantation giant in RN what took a shine to me. I lacked that boy fine, too. He would come over to see me ever time he get a chanked. One night he lo he gwine our axe his mars tur to buy me so's me and him could get married. Well, adder dat he didn't come no mo. I waited and I watched, but I didn't hear nothing of dat nigger. Adder while I got worried. I was afraid the patterollers done caught him, or maybe he done found some gal he lack better dan he do me. So I begin to inquire about him and found that his Mars tur done sold him to a white man what tuck him way down yonder to Alabama. Well ma'am, I grieved that oh dat nigger so dat my heart was heavy in my brayas. I knowed I never would see him no mo. Soon adder dat, peace was cleared and the niggers was free to go war day pleased. My folk stayed on with Moss Dan fair a year, den day, sighed to go to Alabama and farm. We hit it off to Alabama and I begin to go bout some with de young bucks. But somehow I couldn't get my men off dat other nigger. Well ma'am, one day at a big meetin' I runned up on him. I was so happy I shouted all over dat meetin' house. We just tuck up war we left off and F.O. long us got married. And, Aunt Molly continued, they lived happily until his death about twenty years ago. She now lives in Uniontown happy and contented. She has her garden and flowers, but emphasizes that the old days was the best of all. Interview with Alonza Fantroy Tombs. Gertha Couric, H.W., Ufala. He belonged to Bob Tombs of Georgia. Missy, said Alonza Fantroy Tombs, I see the proudest nigger in the world, case I was a slave belonging to Moss Robert Tombs of Georgia, the grandest man dat ever lived, next to Jesus Christ. He was the best stump speaker in the state, and he had mo friends dan a graveyard has ghosts. He was show a kind man, and dear warn't no one livin', who loved his wife and home mo dan moss bob. Missy, Uncle Lon continued, he was near, bout to greet's man dat Eber come out in the south. He were a good businessman, he were straight as day make m, and he show enjoy playin' a good joke on someone. I you see to see him a walkin' down the road in the early mornin' and I knowed it were him a from a long distance, case he was so tall. I guess you knowed all about his a servin' in the state legislature and in the United States Congress and a be in a genel in the war and him be in the Secretary of State in the Federacy. Alonza Fantroy Tombs, T.R., Ufala. Alabama. I was bound on Moss Bob's plantation in the double grade quarters. My pappy's name was Sam Fantroy Tombs and my mammy was Idabel Tombs. In the slabbery times I was too young to work in the fields, so my job was to hunt and fish and feed the stock in the evening. My pappy was a preacher and Moss Bob learned him to read and write, and would let him go f on plantation to plantation on the Sabbath day a preaching the gospel. He was Moss Bob's carriage driver. Yes em, white folks, Moss Bob was a good provider, too. Us niggers eat e at home on Sundays, and us had fried chicken, pot pies, bacon, beef, pork, and hot coffee. On the other days, our meals was fixed for us so dat the time us got for res could be spent dat way. On sad day us stopped work at noon and would come with our vessels to get flour, sugar, lard and other supplies. My mammy's pots and pans was so bright that they looked like silver, and she was one of the best cooks in the lawn. She used to cook fine milk yeast bread and cracklin' bread. 
All us slaves on Moss Bob's place was cared for lack de white folks. We had de white folks doctor to treat us when we was sick. We had good clothes, good food and we was treated fair. Dear weren't no mean peoples on our plantation. White lady, I members Moss Bob's smokehouse best of all. It had everything in it f um, possum to deer, and de wine cellar. Don't say nothing. Dat was de place I longed to roam. But Moss Bob, he drink too much. Dat was his only fault. He hit de bottle too hard. I couldn't understand it neither, case he left off smokin' in later years when he thought it weren't good for him, but he kept a drinkin'. I been ma ed twice, misties. De fust time to Ida Walker. She died at childbirth, the little fella died too. Den I ma ed Alice James, and she's been gone nigh on to twenty year now. My pappy, Reverend Sam Fantroy mied me both times. At her de surrender, nary a slave left Moss Bob. He gib Evie nigger over twenty-one a mule, some lawn and a house to start off with yassum, misties, I kin read and write, my pappy learnt me how. I'm eighty-six year old now and still going strong, septin, bout six years ago I had a stroke. But I come out all right. I lives here with my sister and she's good to me. The only thing left for me to do is to wish dat when I cross dat river I can slip back to the old place to see some of my friends. Interview with William Henry Towns. Levi D. Shelby, Jr., Tuscumbia, Alabama. This was dat long ago. It's been so long since, I don't remember much, William Henry, Bill, Towns said talking of slavery days. Towns was only seven when the Civil War began his memories are those of childhood, which he mixes with reminiscences and opinions of the older slaves with whom he came in contact immediately after the war. Towns knows the exact date of his birth. He says. I was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama, December 7, 1854. My mother was named Jane Smoots. She come from Baltimore, Maryland. My father's name was Joe Towns, and he come from Huntsville, Alabama. I had a passel of brothers and sisters, Charlie and Bob was my brothers, Betty, Kate, Lula and Neely was my sisters. Dear wasn't but two of us enduring slavery. Dat was me and Neely, the rest was born at her slavery. Me and Neely was Townses, the rest, Charlie, Kate, Lula, Bob and Betty was Joneses. How dat come bout was dis away. Endurant slavery my father was sold to another slave owner. After the war my mother married Frank Jones. Den dis other chillin was born. It done been so long since all of dis was I disremembers most bout it. Anyway, the big house was a two-story house, white like Moe's houses endurant that time. On the north side of the big house set a great, big barn, where all the stock and stuff that was raised was kept. Off to the southwest of the barn and west of the big house set about five or six log houses. These house was built fasten a space of ground in the center of a SQUAE what the houses made. Anybody could stand in his front do and see in at the front of the other houses. Sometimes in during the week and on Sunday, too, the people would get together out in dis SQUAE and talk for going to bed. The chillin' what was too young to work was always out in the front plain. Jess across from our place was another with the quarters built mows, the same as Orn Septon, that day had a picket fence ruin the quarters to prevent em from running away. Course Mr. Young didn't have to worry about his Hans running away, cause he want a mean man like some of the slaveholders was. He never spoke harsh or whooped M, and he didn't loan nobody else to do it neither. I remember one day a fellow come from across on another farm and spoke something about Mr. Young being too easy with his servants. He said, them darn niggers will think they as good as you if and you keep up the rate you goin' now, Young. Mr. Young just up and told him if he ever spoke like that again he'd call his bluff. Mr. Young told him that he didn't work his people like day was oxes. All of Mr. 
Young's hands liked him cause he didn't make em sleep on corn shuck mattresses and he didn't have day meals cooked in a wash pot. A lot of the other slaves didn't know what it was to eat meat, lessen it was a holiday. Mr. Young load his people to eat just what he eat. I hear my mother tell a tale, bout a man what took a meat skin and whipped his chillin's mouth with it to fool folks like they had some meat for dinner. Old Caleb told one a lil' bit bigger end dat, though. He said one night him and a feller was comin' from prayer meeting and they runned, crossed a possum set tin in the root of a tree by the side of the road. He say he stopped to get him and this other feller told him he wouldn't bother with him cause he wouldn't get none of him no how. Caleb A.S.T. him why he said that. He said, cause your old master is gwine take him just soon as you get home with him. Caleb told him dat Mr. Young wasn't dat kinner man. The other feller hope had Caleb to catch dat possum, and he got a piece of him the next night when everybody come in from the fiel. Caleb said the old feller enjied the meat so much that he wished he took him and his family the whole possum. We didn't live so far from Big Spring Creek. Co se, we didn't do no fishing, cause we young guns had to tend gaps to keep the cattle off and the crops. The grown-ups had to go to the fiel. Life was kinner happy during slavery cause we never knowed nothing about any other sort of life or freedom. All we knowed was work from one end of the year to the other, septin on holidays. Then we'd have to go to church or sit around a fire and lease end to the old folks tell stories. The grown-ups would go to a dance or do something else for entertainment. Coesi us young guns got a heap of pleasure out in dem fairy tales dat was told us by the older ones. I know ma and dem used to tell some of the AWF less tales sometimes. I'd be afraid to go from one part of the house to the other without and somebody with me. Us young guns would had to play some sort of a game for entertainment. Dear was a whole lot of games and riddles to be played dem days. It have been so long since I played any of M I S E Mo's near disremembers the biggest part of M. I members a song or two and a few riddles what old Caleb used to tell us. The song goes something like this. Saturday night and Sunday, too. Had a yaller gal on my mind. Monday morning, break of day. White folks had me gwine. The riddles was like this. Slick as a mole, black as a coal. Got a great long tail like a thunder hole. Skillet. Crooked as a rainbow, teeth like a cat. Guess all of your life, but you can't guess that. Blackberry bush. Grows in the winter, dies in the spring. Lives with the root sticking straight up. Icicle. Dear was another song what Caleb used to sing. It goes like this. Were you gwine buzzard? Were you gwine crow? Gwine down to the river to do jess so. Dear was a whole lot more to dat song what I disremembers. Another song what comes to my min is. Hawk and the buzzard went down to the law. When the hawk got back he had a broken jaw. Lady's pocketbook on the judge's bench. Hayden had no use for a pocketbook sense. Sometimes I visits with old Mingo White and me and him talks over dem days dat me and him was boys. We gets to talkin' and for you knows it old Mingo is cryin' like a baby. Cordon to what he says he is lucky to be a livin'. This is one thing I never likes ter talk bout. When slavery was goin' on it was all right for me cause I never had it hard, but it just want right to treat human beings that way. If we hadn't they had to work and slave for nothing, we might have some pin to show for what we did do, and wouldn't have to live from pillar to Piznow. William Henry Towns, T.R., Tuscumbia, Alabama. Speaking of clothing, everything that we wore back then was made by Han. Many a night my ma used to set and spin with a spindle. I have set and done the carden for her so she could get her toss done. In the summer we would wear underwear what was made out in cotton. In the winter it was made out in flannel. The shoes was made of cowhide what was tanned right dear on the place. Dem was the hard shoes I ever seen. 
sometimes day'd wear out for day was anyways soft, and den sometimes adder day was wore out you couldn't hardly bend m. Some of the Hans would go barefooted until the fall and den wear shoes. Slippers want wore den. The fust pair of slippers I ever members havin was the ones what I bought for my wed din. Day didn't cost but a dollar and six bits. My wed din suit didn't cost but eight dollars, and a straw hat to match it cost six bits. As I said afore, Massa Young and Bull Misties was mighty good folks on, count of day never whooped any of they Hans. If and dear was one dat would give trouble day would get rid of him. The overseers had to be kin to the hands or else he was out in a job. The chillin was mighty nice, too. Ever, time day went to town or to the sto, day would bring us young guns some candy or some pin. Join in our farm was a farm where the slaves fared lack dogs. Day was always beaten on some of them. Everybody worked hard in during that time. That was all we thought we was supposed to do, but Abe Lincoln taught us better in that. Some say that Abe want entrusted so much in freeing the slaves as he was in Savon, the Union. Don, make no difference if and he want entrusted in the black folks, he showed done a big thing by trying to save the Union. Some of the slaveholders would double the proportion of work so as to get to whip em when night come. I heard my ma say after slavery that they just whipped the slaves so much to keep them cowed down and cause they might have fought for freedom much sooner and it did come. Caleb come from Norleans, Louisiana. He say dat many a day ship loads of slaves was unloaded dear and sold to the one off errand the most money for them. They had big chains and shackles on them to keep em from getting away. Sometime they would have to go a long ways to get to the farm. They would go in a wagon or on horseback. Talk about learning to read and write, why, if and we so much as spoke of learning to read and write we was scolded like the debil. If and we was caught looking, in a book we was treated same as if and we had killed somebody. A servant bet and t be caught looking, in a book didn't make no difference if you want doing nothing but looking at the pictures. Speaking of church. We went to the same church as the white folks did, only thing was we had to go in the evening after the white folks. The white folks would go along and read the Bible for the preacher, and to keep them from talking of things that might help them to get free. They would sing songs like, Steal Away, Been Toiling at the Hill So Long, and Old Time Religion. Ever, once in a while slaves would run away to the north. Most times they was caught and brought back. Sometimes they would get desperate and would kill them's vs for they would stand to be brought back. One time that I heard of a slave that had escaped and when they tried to catch him he jumped in the creek and drowned his f. He was brought from over in Geogia. He hadn't been in Alabama long for him and two more tried to escape, two of them was caught and brought back but this other one went to the lawn of sweet dreams. After the day's work was done and all had eat, the slaves had to go to bed. Most slaves worked on Saturday just like day did on Monday, that was from kin to cot, or from sun to sun. Mr. Young never worked his slaves, twelve dark on Saturday. He always let M quit ruin F.O. clock. We would spend this time washing and bathing to get ready for church on Sunday. Speaking of holidays, the Hans celebrated ever holiday that dare white folks celebrated. Dear want much to do for entertainment, except in what ISE already said. Ever Christmas we'd go to the big house and get our present, cause old Misty's always give us one. Slaves never got sick much, but when they did they got the best. Deer was always a nurse on the farm, and when a slave got sick day was right deer to give them treatments. Back in those days they used all sorts of roots and yarbs for medicine. Peach tree leaves was one of the mows of N. Sassafras was another what was used of N, it was used mostly in the spring made in tea. Asafetida was another what was used to keep you from having asthma. It was wore round the neck in a lil bag. Prickler ash was another what was taken in the spring. It was supposed to clean the blood. 
Some of the folks would use brass, copper and dimes with holes in them to keep from having their rumortis. I was seven years old when the war commenced. I, members Mrs. Young said when the Yankees come day was going to AST us if and day had been good to us. She said that day was going to AST us all about how much money they had, and how many slaves what they owned. She told us to say they was p folks and that they didn't have no money. I, member my mother said that she hoped Mr. Young and them to hide their money somers in a well that won't be in, used cause it gone dry. Them Yankees show, did clean up war they went along. They would catch chickens by the bunches and kill him and then turn rune and make the old misties clean him and cook him for them. Them Yankees set fire to bales and bales of cotton. They took the white folk C-L-O-S-E and did away with M. Sometimes they would tear M up or give them to the slaves to wear. The war ended in 65 and I was 11 years old then. Just after the war we was turned loose to go for our Seth. What I mean by that, we was free. I didn't mean that we left Mr. Young's cause we stayed with him for the longest after slavery was over. My first work was in a blacksmith shop down on West 6th Street. I worked for 50 cents a day then until I learned to trade. After I worked at the blacksmith shop for about two years I took up carpenter work. I served apprentice for three years. I followed carpentry and G the res of my life. I married Lizzie Anderson when I was 21 years old. She want but 17 years old. We didn't have no big wed din. We just had the family dear. I raised ten chillin' up until April the 24th. That's when William Henry died. My chillin's doin' pretty well in life. Dear's two of my sons what's doctors, one is a carpenter. The other one is grand orator of the Shriners. My gals is doin' fine, too. Three of them is been school teachers, one a beauty cultist and the other one a nurse. I feel satisfied about my chillin' now. They seems to be able to make a livin' for the SEVES pretty well. I thinks that Abe Lincoln was a mighty fine man even if he was tryin' to save their union. I don't like to talk about this that have done happened. It done passed so I don't say much about it, especially the presidents, cause it might cause a disturbance right now. All men means well, but some of them ain't broad-minded enough to do anything for nobody but them CFS. Any man that tries to help humanity is a good man. Interview with Stepney Underwood. John Morgan Smith. The Court Jester. Yasu, I was a slave. I was ten year old when the war begin. Uncle Stepney spoke the words between intermittent jerks of an uncontrollable voice. The nervousness which resulted from hard work and a long struggle for existence had not only given him palsy, but had left him with an upheaving diaphragm. Thus he shook and shivered while stuttering so constantly as to be almost unintelligible. My mammy belonged to the Johnstons and my pappy was owned by the Underwoods, he continued. They lived next to each other on two big plantations in Lowndes County. They was good peoples, damn Underwoods. I remembers that day used to think I was as funny as a little monkey. The Masa USTA laugh his head off at me, and when dear was parties, the guests would always say, War Stepney. We wants to see Stepney dance. I USTA cut many a pigeon wing fur m. One day adder I finish my chores, I slip off and go across the line to see my mammy. When I was a comin' back thuf to woods, I met up with two patty rollers. They stop me and say, nigger, who you belong to? Masa Jim John's on, I answers. What you a doin' out here, then, they say, all the time a slippin' a little closer so's to grab me. I don't take time to give em no mo answers cause a I know dat dis meant a beaten. I starts my legs a flyin' and I runs through the fours like a scart rabbit with dem patty rollers right behind me. My bare feets flew over dem stones and I just hit the high spots in the ground. I knowed dem two mens didn't have no chance to cotch me, but this show meant a whoopin when I got home. Stepney Underwood, T.R., Birmingham, Alabama. 
but I didn't go home that night. I stay out in the woods and build me a little fire. I laid down under a sycamore tree a tryin' to make up my men to go and take that beatin'. I heard the panthers a screamin' away off in the fours and the wildcats a howlin', and how I wished I could a been with my mammy. Evie now and then, I could see eyes a shernin' in the darkness and rustlins in the bushes. Warn't no use of me a cryin' cause a I was a long way from home and dear warn't no one to could hear me. Evie thing seemed to be agin' me. Far off across the ridge I heard a screech owl a callin', and I know dat meant death. I was glad I had my overalls on so's I could turn my pockets inside out arts to stop him. Adder I done dis, he shown up stopped. Then my left ear it commenced to itchin', and I knowed dat someone was a sayin' something mean about me. Probably dat overseer dat was a goin' to whoop me when I got home. Soon I fell slap to sleep on a bed of moss. The next day I was awful hungry, and long bout the time the sun was a comin' over the ridge, I heard some men's a comin' through the brush. It was the massa, the overseer and some emo men's. I runs toward the Masa and I calls as loud as I could, Masa Jim, here I is. He come up with an awful frown on his face and the overseer, he had a big whoop in his hon. You little burhead nigger de bill, the Masa say, I teach you to run away from yo, place. Come on home, S.E. Gwine give you a good breakfast and fix you up in some decent clothes. I.S.E. got visitors a comin' and he a you is out in the woods when I needs you to dance. Then de massa, he smile like I ain't done nothin' wrong. I guess you wants your mammy, you little lonesome pickaninny. Well, I suppose I had to go over and buy her. You little debil you, now get on home. Personal Conversation with Charlie Van Dyke 713 South Lawrence Street, Mobile, Alabama Written by Mary A. Poole It took fifty dollars to put Uncle Charlie on the floor. An old colored man, named Charlie Van Dyke, living at 713 South Lawrence Street, Mobile, Alabama claims to be 107 years old, but he has no authentic record of his birth. He told the writer he was born in North Carolina, and when he was 10 years old, Mr. William Marty King, who owned his mother, Nellie Drish, moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where the King family remained about a year, moving then from Tuscaloosa down into Dallas County near Selma, Alabama. While Mr. and Mrs. King and their family remained in Tuscaloosa, Charlie's mother Nellie Drish met and married William Van Dyke, who belonged to the Van Dykes, who owned the neighboring plantation. Charlie assumed his stepfather's name, but knew little of him, or of the Van Dykes to whom his stepfather belonged, because, as Charlie explained to the writer, after the Kings moved down in Dallas County. As Charlie always referred to his home in Alabama, and brought his mother Nellie and her family with them, his stepfather could only visit them once a year, and that privilege was given him on Christmas Day. He had to start back the next day, as he had to make the trip to and fro on horseback. Uncle Charlie said the Kings owned about a thousand acres in Dallas County and had about a hundred head of slaves, but with all their riches they lived in a plain plank house. He smiled and said, nowadays folks passing such a house, would say, colored folks live there. The slave quarters were the regular log wood cabins, said Uncle Charlie, with space between each row and a little plot of ground to separate each cabin to itself. Uncle Charlie said his mother cooked for the white folks, and sometimes she didn't get down to their cabin but on Sunday afternoon, that he being the oldest had to look after the younger children and that he was never required to do heavy work as he broke his leg when a boy, so the folks let him just work around the yard and look after his sisters and brothers and also the other slave children. Uncle Charlie said Mr. King traveled a lot, went to France once, that took almost a year and the overseer had full charge and he was mean and made everybody stand around. He even made the slaves shuck corn on Sundays, each had their allotted amount to shuck before they could stop. When the writer asked about church on the plantation, Uncle Charlie replied, Church was what they called it but all that preacher talked about was for us slaves to obey our masters and not to lie and steal. Nothing about Jesus was ever said, and the overseer stood there to see the preacher talked as he wanted him to talk. 
The only day that Uncle Charlie said they were given any real holiday was Christmas, everybody got his drink of whiskey on Christmas, and not another drink until next Christmas, it sure seemed a long time between drinks. Added Charlie with a smile. Uncle Charlie said they did let you have a funeral when someone died, they made the coffin on the plantation and carried it by hand to the graveyard, singing as they went along. He tried to recall the hymns, but all he could chant in a sing-song way was. Last word he said was about Jerusalem. And he traveled along to the grave. When asked about war days, Uncle Charlie was first on the Confederate side, then on the Northern side, and he seemed somewhat bewildered about it all, he said he saw a stockade, as he called it, in Selma, Alabama. And he remembered food stuff being sent to the soldiers, and also recalled the Yankees coming, and a captain coming up the road and telling them the soldiers were coming. Uncle Charlie said the colored folks thought the captain had to go back north before they came back, but in a flash like lightning there they were, hundreds of them. And they scared folks so bad some of them jumped in the river and tried to swim across and those that couldn't, they just drowned. When the writer tried to check up on Uncle Charlie's age, asking him how old he was when the war started, he replied. I don't know but I was a man long afore it all started, lady. And I was thirty-three years old when I married, bout a year after the surrender. When asked why he waited so long to get married, Uncle Charlie said. Didn't you know in slavery days they wouldn't allow a man to marry unless he could split a hundred rails a day? The writer smiled and said. Now, Uncle Charlie, and then he chuckled, and said. Well, I guess the right one didn't come long till I met her. When asked if he had a regular wedding feast, he replied. Yes, lady, it took fifty dollars. Zero zero to put me on the floor. Charlie and Teresa had five head of children, as Uncle Charlie expressed it, of which three are dead and two living, but he claims his children do not look after him, but his church folks and friends give him the helping hand. He is a member of the St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church, of Mobile. Uncle Charlie says he has his religion from the foregone prophets, that he don't understand this day religion, that he came along when people were serving Daniel's God, and when people had to be born again. Now they serve a sanctified God and jump from one religion to another. Uncle Charlie finished the interview by saying, Lord teach me how to pray, and teach me to love it woo. Interview with Lila Walker William B. Strickland, Carbon Hill. I hear the whirrin' of queer wings. I walked through a small glade overshadowed by large oak trees, near Carbon Hill in Walker County, Alabama. A weird little cabin confronted me. Its porch and steps loosely held to the main part of the structure by a few weak boards. Lila Walker, an old Negro woman, squatted on the steps with her chin resting in her black hands, in an attitude of deep reverie. As the old woman heard me approaching she raised her head in cordial greeting. Come in, young Mars Tur, she said. How is you today? Fine, Aunt Lila, I answered. How's the world treating you? Oh, I can't complain, she replied. The old woman continued. It might be safer to set inside, case day says when the sun swing low lack dis dat de myasas what make you sick, gin to rise out in yon swamp. Then she chuckled, I been here since befo de wa, and I ain't never seen no myasas rise out in dat swamp yet. Yasu, dat show is so, but from what I seed rise out in it my pinion is dat day done left long befo dis. But I seed queer wings weren't out in dat swamp just f-o days atter de surrender, and I seed em near, bout evy day since. I seed em and I heard em just a worin. Nazu, I show can't splain de wings, but I is got my pinion how come day is. When I tells you what took place here durin dem dark old days, den maybe you'll have yorn. Ole Misty's died, f-o de war, and ole Massa, he too old to go. He didn't do nothing, but sat around, and read the books and papers. Peer lack to me he just plumb forget bout young Misty's after her mammy died, and the little gal just growed up lack a wild flower in the woods, sepan for a handsome young boy on the next plantation. Day was nearly always together. 
by and by the boy got old enough to go to the wa. It was just a little fo de close. Then young misties, she droop and she droop. Reckly she gin to swoon, long just anywhere she would. One day she swoon and nothing I could do would bring her back to her senses. I just couldn't fetch her to. I call old Masa and he get a doctor. They put me out in the room and I ain't never heard what that doctor said till yet, but old Masa, he go stark wild. He holla and carry on in his sleep all the night, and the next day he drove the young misties away. Dear was a cabin den in the swamp, and she went dar to live. I snuck out dar and towed her vittles to her afo days and days. She always grabbed me and say, don't you love me and don't you believe in me, mammy. Coese I does, honey chili, c-a-s-e i you see to sing to you bout the good old lawn, of promise. Then I says to her, these times is powerful triflin', and maybe f-o long eyes gwine home and the white folks will miss me c-a-s-e day can't raise chillins. Then she cry and I cry. Bout that time the word come of the surrender. Old Masa seemed to come to his wits den and he kept a close watch on me so's I can't leave the house to carry the food. On the foth day, I caught a chance and I snuck off. When I come close to the cabin I call, but young Misty's never answer. Then I went to the do, but I never go in the do, c-a-s-e millions of black wings come a were and out in the house. I run and run and I pray too, but the big black wings still follow me. Sometimes in the early morning I still hears and sees two pairs of wings, sometimes white, sometimes black. Yasu, I is I mean to tell you about old Masa, what come of him. One evening I ventured to the age of that swamp, and some pen cracked under my feet. I is just about to run when I sees it's just a piece of paper. I sees it has written on it so I taken it to old Masa. Then when he read that he show nuff go plum crazy. Bout that time they open what they called a sane slylum in Tusalusi and they taken old Masa Darin, a little later he died. The young boy who went to Wa, what about him? They say he was killed in the lost battle of Apomatox. That piece o' oh, paper. Yasu. It was a paper saying that young Misties and the young boy on the next plantation was night in my age. Listen, young Masa. I hears dem queer wings a warren dot. Interview with Simon Walker. Ira S. Jordan. Softly mumbling to himself and gravely shaking a bare, shiny head that had only a fringe of white, closely kinked woolly hair about the ears, the old negro shuffled out of the crowded courtroom into the corridor. Turning clear, Quizzical eyes toward a group of white men loitering near the doorway and addressing no one in particular, with a final emphatic shake of his head he said. Hit do beat all, the way these young niggers is all lose in trouble with the law. Now, when ah was a young buck the only law amongst us niggers was the word uv o massa. Meb you alls here tell o him, c-u-n-l Hugh Walker. E-f the c-u-n-l wasn't the richest man anywhere, round Forsyth, Georgie. Then my name ain't Simon Walker. Yasu. That's my name too. Ah, uh, belong to the CUNL long with more an a hundred emo slaves, and my mammy and pappy beefo me belong to the walkers. All UV am gone now, gone to glory, and this old nigger here all by himself, the lost one or the family. The CUNL, he had eight boys, and all, except the least ungene the Confederates. Twas a tobel sad day when young Moss Chap was brung home with one of his legs shot plumb off by the Yankees. And me set him dar by him a fan and erway de flies endurin' all the long hot days whilst he was layin' dar on de age o' kingdom come. And all the time I was then kin de laud dat my lil Moss Jim was too young to go to de wav, all the CUNLS sons day had body servants, and I was Moss Jim's boy. I used to look at her him, go to school with him and play in the woods, tell school was out, and ef he had, er gone to the wav, this nigger would er been right dar with him. Nazu, Moss Jim and me never did go to the wav, but us seed the Yankees win, Jenel Sherman come marching through our plantation. 
An EF are live for a thousand years I'd never forget that day. I ain't never seed so many men in one crowd befo, or since, and the loss one UV, M wearin' the same kind of CLOES. They come right up in the yard, and a passel of M tromped right into the big house, just like it was therein. They turned everything wrong side out arts a lookin' fair the silver and the jewelry, but ol' missus, she done had news day was comin', and all the stuff was hid in the woods. When they couldn't fin the plate and jewelry, they was hoppin' mad, and at her talkin' all the hams and rations they could tote off they sot fire to the smokehouse, and the bon and all the cotton dat was piled around the gin house. To keep the Confederates from gettin' it, they said. They took all the good houses and mules and left dear ol' hungry, broke down nags that won't fitten fair nothin' cept for Lisa. But they didn't hoot nobody, not Evan Cookie when she tuck her broom at her em in the kitchen. Simon Walker, Birmingham, Alabama I reckon dem soldiers thought the CUNL was plum ruined when they left, but Ah says, CUNL Walker was a rich man, and F.O. long as done bought fresh rations, and drive up the hargs from the swamp and killed mo meat. Then the CUNL he sought off fair mo mules, and when day come the wuke went on urgent. Come the day when all the niggers was sought free. CUNL Walker call all the slaves up to the big house, and standin' dear on the veranda he told him day was now all free niggers, free to go war day pleased. But, ef anybody wanted to stay on the plantation to hole up their hans. Mose all the hans stayed on the plantation, till the CUNL died, and the family sorter broke up. That was F.O. yes adder the surrender. Well, adder dat, ah uh, just drifted around, and Finley landed here in Birmingham in 1888. Won't nothin' much here den but muddy roads and swamps, but I got er job totian mortar war day was buildin' the fust brick sto, and den er long time atterwards I wa ked fair de tc and i fair twenty five years. But de ol' nigger ain't no mo good fair hod labor. All da white folks done gone on, and here I is on de welfare, just waitin' fair de good lord to call me up there fair de great reunion, amen. Interview with Lucindia Washington. Alice S. Barton. Little black Cindy skipped along the narrow path that led to the spring house. In her hand she swung an empty cedar pail that she was soon to fill with cool, fresh milk. She entered the small glade overhung with willow trees and spread with soft grass, and gazed at the sparkling water of the spring as it caught the beams of sunlight coming through the trees and reflected them in myriads of little points. Shadows of the waving leaves danced over the ground and up the side of the stone spring house. How cool and nice it was here, she thought. Gentle breezes rustled the limbs of small saplings and quietly stirred the long grass along the upper part of the branch. A young rabbit hopped from a little clump of bushes and Cindy watched him as the small creature drank thirstily from the crystal water. Occasionally, the bunny would lift his head as if warned by a slight sound, but in a moment she saw him fold back his delicate ears and once more dip his small mouth into the babbling water. After quenching his thirst, the rabbit hopped a few feet away and nibbled on a wisp of tender grass. Cindy was as still as a statue as she watched the procedure. That's the cutest little bunny I ever seed, she said to herself. I wish I could catch him. But Cindy knew that she could not catch a rabbit, so she was content to stand in the shadow of a sycamore and gaze eagerly at the animal, nibbling the grass. Suddenly, without warning, Cindy's eyes protruded from their sockets with an expression of fear. Slipping noiselessly through the green undergrowth she saw a giant rattler gliding slowly toward the young rabbit. She wanted to cry out, but she was afraid, afraid of attracting the rattler's attention toward her. She was deathly afraid of snakes. Since babyhood, she had harbored a growing fear of them. If Cindy had been still before this time, she now became a frozen image. It would not have been apparent that she was even breathing. So frightened was she of the snake that her whole body broke out in a profuse perspiration. Her eyes were glued to the tremendous brown monster which, without the slightest sound, boozed deftly toward its victim. Cindy was hypnotized. The snake seemed to hold her in a strange spell. 
Slowly, inexorably he moved entirely out of the undergrowth and was now weaving on the clear ground. He approached the rabbit within a distance of three feet and began to carefully form himself in a deadly coil. Cindy saw every movement. She saw each diamond on its brown back, each scale of its crawling skin, each lash and point of its tongue, the whiteness of its breast, the large track that it had made in the sand. She watched its eyes gleam, expressionless and ominous. She gazed at the deadly mouth as it slowly began to open. She was aware of the first appearance of the two death-like fangs pointing downward. She saw the ten-buttoned rattle stand erect. She saw it quiver, shake, sound. She saw the rabbit turn with fear. She saw the strike, the sinking of the fangs into the soft, brown fur. She watched the rabbit give an ephemeral struggle. Witnessed the brief pitiful look in the bunny's eyes and at last saw the mouth sink into the small belly and draw the last breath of life away. The experience was more than the little girl could stand. Cindy was now in a state of frenzy. She could not move, nor speak, nor turn her eyes. She could only stare. At what? The monstrous snake then girded himself for further onslaught. After being sure his victim was dead, he loosed his grip and stretched at full length upon the ground. Drew the rabbit out until it too was stretched carefully out with its hind feet together and its head pointing in the opposite direction. Then followed an experience that to Cindy seemed entirely impossible. The snake took the hind feet of the rabbit in his mouth, until gradually they had disappeared. Then came what seemed to Cindy an agonized struggle. The snake's mouth stretched almost to the breaking point as it began slowly to close over the rest of the rabbit's rear quarter. With fits and starts and jerks and stretches, the rattler reeled and squirmed. Contorted and wreathed and sucked until the rabbit had half gone. With the last great effort the serpent threw himself into another series of bodily contortions that seemed to the Cindy positively agonizing to him, until at last the rabbit had entirely disappeared from the earth. For several minutes, Cindy apparently watched the tremendous hump in the snake move slowly backward. With gradually diminishing intermittent jerks, the snake finally got the small animal to his digestive tract. The monster then crawled to a hot sandy section and went to sleep. Two hours later it was twilight. An overseer was walking along the path to the spring house. He paused for a moment beneath a sycamore tree to rest and cool himself. As his eyes roamed the shadowy little glade they came to rest on the body of a little negro girl, lying inert upon the soft grass with the handle of a cedar bucket clutched in a death grip. He lifted the small black form into his arms and carried her to the house. He saw in her face an expression of mingled agony and fear. Yasu, white folks, that was me, Aunt Cindy smiled as she told me of the experience, eighty years later. That was the biggest snake I ever seed. He must have been seven feet long. Cindy Washington, T.R., Utah, Alabama. All this happened in Sumter County where I was bound. Us had a pretty place dear. I'll never forget how the niggers worked dear gardens in the moonlight. Dear weren't no time in the day. The white folks work tucked that time. The overseer rung a big bell for us to get up by in the morning at F.O. o'clock, and the fuss thing we done was to feed the stock. You ax was we punished? Yasu, we was punished for something, most of all for stealin'. Yasu, we was taught to read and write, but most of the slaves didn't want to learn. Us little niggers would hide our books under the steps to keep F.O.M. havin' to study. Us go to church with the white folks on Sunday and sit in the back, and then we go home and eat a big Sunday meal. When we got sick f um eaten, too much or some pen, Massa Jim Godfrey was a doctor and he'd tend to us. Then when new nigger babies came, nine little black bugs was tied up in rags, rune, dear necks for to make the babies teeth easy. When I was my ed, white folks, at the age of thirteen, Alex Washington, my husband and me had a $40 wed din. My misties baked me a cake, and a white schoolmaster named Henry Hindron spoke the ceremony. Me and that old husband had twenty-two chillins. Yas ma'am. I showed us believe in ghosties. 
we's got one good spirit and one bad un. One goes to Heben and de utter stays on earth. Ghosty show does lack whiskey, case Dale follow you if and you got any. If and you put it on the ground beside you, do, Dale lose track of you. Always give a goes to Rot Han, side of the road, white folks, and he won't bother you. Yes my chili, I is got religion. I see Jesus a hanging f on the cross. He give his blood so dat us could live. I knows I is going to he been. Interview with Eliza White, age around 80. Opelika, Alabama. Preston Klein, Opelika, Alabama. She seed H N T. Eliza White lives by the Central of Georgia Railroad tracks in Opelika. The passing of many years has not dulled her mind, and so she was able to tell of many things which happened, Bifo de wa. Yes, Sue, I was a slave. Ole Massa was named Billy Jones, and Ole Misty's was named Angeline. They lived in Harris County, Georgia, close to Columbus. My pappy and mammy was Peter and Francis Jones, and I had a brother, Dennis, and a sister, Georgian. Massa was a good man, and I did love Ole Misty's. They was mighty good to us niggers. Fed us out day own garden. We had checked homespun clothes for Evi day, and petty calico and dyed osnabug ones for Sunday. I went to church with the white folks, set in, in the foot of the carriage. I, members well the Sunday I fust seen a shoutin'. It was two white ladies. Massa and Misty's had four chillin'. Two of dem, Dave and Quit, was bad fighting kids. I seen Massa make dem strip to day waste, and whip em, den make dem go in and bathe. Masa lived in a big, fine white house. He had two or three hundred slaves, and the quarters was in two long rows, running up near, bout to the big house on the hill. They even raised deer on the place. The houses in the quarters was two-room log houses with a shed room to cook in. My mammy was the cook at the big house, and granny was the weaver. Pappy was the bedmaker, he made most of the beds out in Poplar. I had a little chair in the corner where I sought and kept the flies off in Misty's with a green twig brush. Whenever Massa sought any the slaves off in the place he had to give em passes so the paterollers wouldn't catch em and whip em for running away. The paterollers was a good thing for the lazy ones. When daylight come we had to get up, else we'd be whipped. Massa didn't have his slaves whipped much, just when day was lazy and wouldn't work. Every why now and then we would have some good frolics, mostly on Saturday nights. Somebody would play the fiddle and we all danced to the music. The folks sure had some big times at the cornshuckens, too. The men would work two or three days, hauling the corn and pillin' it near the crib. Then they would invite folks from other quarters to come and help with the shuckin'. While they shucked they would holler and sing. You jumped and I jumped. Swear, by God you out-jumped me. Ha! Ha! Round the corn, Sally. Granny used to give us tea made out in sage roots, mullen, pine, whorehound, that show was bitter stuff. We had petty beads made with corn. And I still, members the Christmas I got my fust shoes. I just hugged dem tight and went to sleep holdin' em. Day was button shoes. When we heard the Yankees was comin', we hid all the meat and rations and the silver in the big swamp, and turned the horses loose, and all us kids hid in the bed ticks, mattresses. The Yankees stayed around two or three days and would pull the hands out of deer beds by day toes. But I really see the high and tea one time. I knowed it was. There was one old man been havin' the toothache all the time, he used to keep his jaw tied up. I was gwine over to see him daytime. Well, for I got dear I seen what looked like him comin'. When I got nearer he turned to a man riding a mule and wearing a big hat. Then, for he got to the house he was plumb gone. That's how I knowed it was a high and tea. Interview with Mingo White. Levi D. Shelby, Jr. Tuscumbia, Alabama. Jeff Davis used to camouflage his horse. 
Mingo White lives at Burleson in Franklin County, Alabama, and though he doesn't know his age he remembers that he was a big boy when the war between the states began. His reminiscences of slavery days, when he was a field hand, are an incongruous combination of stories of severe cruelty in free Saturday afternoons, Sunday holidays and happy festivals of corn shucking and community cotton picking. He talks of punishments visited on recalcitrant slaves beyond human endurance and of tasks saddled on one person that would take half a dozen to accomplish. Mingled with these perhaps fogged memories of the nonagenarian are interesting sidelights of drivers, pate rollers, ku kluxers and sharecropping in Reconstruction days. I was born in Chester, South Carolina, but I was mostly raised in Alabama, Mingo said. When I was about F.O. or five years old, I was loaded in a wagon with a lot mo people in hit. Where I was bound, I don't know. Whatever become of my mammy and pappy I don know for a long time. I was told there was a lot of slave speculators in Chester to buy some slaves for some folks in Alabama. I, members that I was took up on a stand, and, a lot of people come, ruin, and, felt my arms and, legs and, chist, and, ast me a lot of questions. Beefo, we slaves was took to the trading, post old Marsa Crawford told, us to tell Eva body what ast us if we'd ever been sick to tell, em dad us never been sick in our life. Us had to tell, em all sorts of lies for our Marsa or else take a beaten. I was just a lil tang took away from my mammy and pappy, just when I needed M.O.'s. The only Karen that I had or ever knowed anything about was give to me by a friend of my pappy. His name was John White. My pappy told him to take care of me for him. John was a fiddler and many a night I woke up to find myself sleep twix his legs whilst he was playing for a dance for the white folks. My pappy and mammy was sold from each other too, the same time as I was sold. I used to wonder if I had any brothers or sisters, as I had always wanted some. A few years later I found out I didn't have none. I'll never forget the trip from Chester to Burleson. I wouldn't remember so well I don't guess, seepin', I had a big old sheep dog named Trailer. He followed right in back of the wagon dad I was in. Us had to cross a wide stream what I tucked to be a river. When we started, crossed, old trailer never stopped following. I was watching him clost so if he gived out I was going to try to get him. He didn't give out, he didn't even have to swim. He just walked long and lapped the water like a dog will. John took me and kept me in the cabin with him. The cabin didn't have no furniture in hit like we has now days. The bed was a one-legged, hit was made in the corner of the room, with the leg set tin out in the middle of the flow. A plank was run twixt the logs of the cabin and nailed to the post on the front of the bed. Across the foot an utter plank was run into the logs and nailed to the leg. Then some straw or corn shucks was piled on for a mattress. Us used any tang what we could get for kiver. The table had two legs, the legs set out to the front whilst the back part was nailed to the wall. Us didn't have no stove. There was a great big fireplace where the cooking was done. Us didn't have to cook, though, lessen us got hungry after supper been served at the house. I weren't nothing but a chilly enduring slavery, but I had to whoop the same as any man. I went to the fiel and hosed cotton, pulled fodder and picked cotton with the res of the Hans. I kept up too, to keep from getting any lashes that night when us got home. In the winter I went to the woods with the men folks to hope he get wood or to get sap from the trees to make turpentine and tar. If and us didn't do that we made charcoal to run the blacksmith shop with. The white folks was hard on us. They would whoop us bout the lee's lil tang. It wouldn't have been so bad if and us had a had comforts, but to live like us did was nuff to make anybody soon as be dead. The white folks told us dat us born to work for em and dat us was doing fine at dat. The next time dat I saw my mammy I was a great big boy. Dear was a oman on the place whatever body called mammy, Selena White. One day mammy called me and said, Mingo, your mammy is coming. I said, I thought that you was my mammy. 
She said, no I ain't your mammy, your mammy is, way way from here. I couldn't believe dad I had another mammy and I never thought, bout hit any mo. One day I was set tin down at the barn when a wagon come up the lane. I stood ruined lack a chilly will. When the wagon got to the house, my mammy got out and broke and run to me and THO'd her arms ruined my neck and hug and kiss me. I never even put my arms ruined her or nothing of the sort. I just stood dar looking at her. She said, son ain't you glad to see your mammy? I looked at her and walked off. Mammy Selena called me and told me dat I had hurt my mammy's feelings, and dat dis Oman was my mammy. I went off and studied and I begins to member things. I went to Selena and A.S.T. her how long it been since I seen my mammy. She told me dat I had been way from her since I was just a little chilly. I went to my mammy and told her dat I was sorry I done what I did and dat I would lack fair her to forget and forgive me for the way I act when I first saw her. After I had talked with my real mammy, she told me of how the family had been broke up and that she hadn't seen my pappy since he was sold. My mammy never would have seen me no mo if the Lord hadn't a been in the plan. Tom White's daughter married one of Mr. Crawford's sons. They lived in Virginia. Back then it was the custom for women to come home whenever day husbands died or quit M. Mr. Crawford's son died and that THO'd her to have to come home. My mammy had been her maid, so when she got ready to come home she brung my mammy with her. It was hard back in dem days. Ever from morning fo, day break you had to be up and ready to get to the fiel. It was the same ever day in the year, sep on Sunday, and then we was getting up earlier than the folks do now on Monday. The drivers was hard too. They could say whatever they wanted to and you couldn't say nothing for yourself. Somehow or other us had an instinct that we was going to be free. In the event when the day's whoop was done the slaves would be found lock in dear cabins praying for the Lord to free them like he did the chillin' of his A.E.L. If and they didn't lock up, the Marsa or the driver would have heard em and whooped em. The slaves had a way of puttin' a wash pot in the dew of the cabin to keep the sown in the house. I, members once old Ned White was caught praying. The drivers took him the next day and carried him to the pegs, what was F.O. stakes drove in the ground. Ned was made to pull off Evertang but his pants and lay on his stomach, tween the pegs whilst somebody stropped his legs and arms to the pegs. Then they whooped him, twelve the blood run from him like he was a hog. They made all of the Hans come and see it, and they said us get the same tang if us was cotched. They don't blow a man to whoop a horse like they whooped us in dem days. After my mammy come war I was I hope at her with her work. Her toss was too hard for any one person. She had to serve as maid to Mr. White's daughter, cook for all of the Hans, spin and card four cuts of thread a day and then wash. Dear was 144 threads to the cut. If she didn't get all of this done she got 50 lashes that night. Many a night me and her would spin and card so she could get her task the next day. No matter what she had to do the next day she would have to get dem fo cuts of thread, even on wash day. Wash day was on Wednesday. My mammy would have to take the CLOs, about three quarters of a mile to the branch where the washing was to be done. She didn't have no washboard lack day have now days. She had a paddle what she beat the CLOs with everybody knowed when wash day was, case day could hear the paddle for, about three or four miles. Pow pow pow, that's how it sound. She had to iron the CLOs the same day that she washed and then get them four cuts of thread. Lots of times she failed to get them and got the fifty lashes. One day when Tom White was whooping her she said, lay it on Marsa White, case I'm going to tell the Yankees when they come. When Mammy got through spinning the cloth she had to dye it. She used shoemake berries, indigo, bark from some trees, and dar was some kind of rock, probably iron ore, what she got red dye from. The CLOs wouldn't fade neither. The white folks didn't learn us to do nothing but wook. 
Day said Dadus warn't spose to know how to read and write. Dar was one feller named E. C. White what learned to read and write endurin' slavery. He had to carry the chillin's books to school fair m and go back at her dem. His young Marsa taught him to read and write unbeknownst to his father and the res of the slaves. Us didn't have now hard to go, sep church and we didn't get no pleasure out in it, case we warn't load to talk from the time we left home twell us got back. If us went to church the drivers went with us. Us didn't have no church sep the white folks church. After old Ned got sec a terrible beaten fair praying for freedom he slipped off and went to the north to join the Union Army. After he got in the army he wrote to Marsa Tom. In his letter he had those words. I am laying down, Marsa, and getting up, Marsa, meaning that he went to bed when he felt like it and got up when he pleased to. He told Tom White that if and he wanted him he was in the army and that he could come after him. After old Ned had got to the north, the other Hans began to watch for a chance to slip off. Many a one was cotched and brung back. They knowed the penalty what they would have to pay, and this caused some of them to get desperate. Drew their dan to take a beaten, they would choose to fight hit out, twelve day was able to get away or die beefo, they would take the beaten. Lots of times when the paterollers would get after the slaves they would have the worse fight and sometimes the paterollers would get killed. After the war I saw Ned, and he told me the night he left, the paterollers run him for a full days. He say the way he did to keep them from catching him was he went by the woods. The paterollers come in the woods looking for him, so he just got a tree on him and then followed. They figured that he was heading for the free states, so they headed that way too, and Ned Jess followed them for as they could go. Then he clumb a tree and hid whilst they turned rune and come back. Ned went on without any trouble much. The paterollers used to be bad. They would run the folks if and they was caught out after eight o'clock in the night, if and they didn't, have no pass from the Marsa. After the day's wook was done there weren't anything for the slaves to do but go to bed. Wednesday night they went to prayer meeting. We had to be in the bed by nine o'clock. Ever night the drivers come ruined to make show that we was in the bed. I hear tell of folks going to bed and then getting up and going to other plantation. On sat day the Hans walked twelve noon. They had the res of the time to wook day gardens. Ever family had a garden of dear own. On sat day nights the slaves could frolic for a while. They would have parties sometimes and whiskey and homebrew for the servants. On Sundays we didn't do anything but lay rune and sleep, case we didn't lack to go to church. On Christmas we didn't have to do no wook. No more and feed the stock and do the lil wook rune the house. When we got through with that we had the res of the day to run rune wherever we wanted to go. Co se we had to get permission from the Marsa. The owners of slaves used to give corn shuckin parties and invite slaves from other plantations. They would have plenty of whiskey and other stuff to eat. The slaves would shuck corn and eat and drink. They used to give cotton pickings the same way. All of this went on at night. They had jack lights in the cotton patch for us to see by. The lights was made on a forked stick and moved from place to place whilst we picked. The corn shuckin was done at the barn, and they didn't have to have the lights so they could move them from place to place. The only games that I played when I was young was marbles and ball. I used to sing a few songs that I heard the older folks sing lack. Cesus ladies thank they mighty grand. Set tin at the table, coffee pot of rye. Oh, ye rebel union band, have these ladies understand. We leave our country to meet you, Uncle Sam. These songs was bout the soldiers and the war. There was one bout old General Wise what went. Old General Wise was a mighty man. And not a wise man either. It took forty yards of cloth to make a uniform. To march in the happy land of Canaan. Chorus. Ha <laughs> ha, the south light is coming. Charge boys, charge, this battle we muse have. 
to march us in the happy land of Canaan. There was a song, bout General Roddy too. Run o' Roddy through Tuscumbia, through Tuscumbia. We go marching on. Chorus. Glory, glory hallelujah, glory, glory hallelujah. Glory, glory hallelujah as we go marching on. Old Roddy's coat was flying, old Roddy's coat flying, high. Twell it almost touched the sky, we go marching on. I was a pretty big boy when the war broke out. I, remember seeing, the Yankees cross Big Bear Creek Bridge one day. All of the sojars crossed the bridge but one. He stayed on the other side, twell all the res had got, crossed, then he got down often his horse and, took a bottle of sompin, and, strode it all over the bridge. Then he lighted a match to it and, followed the res. In a few minutes the rebel sojars come to the bridge to cross but it was on fire and, they had to swim, cross to the other side. I went home and told my mammy dat de rebels was chasin de union sojars and dat one of de unions had poured some water on de bridge and sodded a fire. She laugh and say, son, don't you know dat water don't make a fire? Dat must have been turpentine or oil. I remember one day Mr. Tom was havin a big barbecue for de rebel soldiers in our yard. Come a big roarin' down the military road, and three men in blue coats rode up to the gate and come on in. Just as soon as the rebels saw them the all run to the woods. In bout five minutes the yard was full of blue coats. They eat up all the grub what the rebels had been eaten. Tom White had to run way to keep the Yankees from gettin' him. F.O. the Yankees come, the white folks took all day CLOs and hung them in the cabins. They told the colored folks to tell the Yankees that the CLOs was dear en. They told us to tell him how good they been to us and that we lacked to live with em. All day that we got news that we was free, Mr. White called us niggers to the house. He said, you are all free, just as free as I am. Now go and get yourself somewhere to stick your heads. Just as soon as he say dat, my mammy hollered out, that's enough for a yearlin. She struck out, crossed the fiel to Mr. Lee Osborne's to get a place for me and her to stay. He paid us seventy-five cents a day, fifty cents to her and two bits for me. He gave us our dinner along with the wages. After the crop was gathered fair that year, me and my mammy cut and hauled wood for Mr. Osborne. Us left, Mr. Osborne that fall and went to Mr. John Rollins. Us made a share crop with him. Ust pick two rows of cotton and he'd pick two rows. Ust pull two rows of corn and he'd pull two rows. He furnished us with rations and a place to stay. Ust sell our cotton and open corn and pay Mr. John Rollins for feed in us. Then we moved with Mr. Hugh Nelson and made a share crop with him. We kept moving and making share crops twell us saved up enough money to rent us a place and make a crop fair ours vs. Us did right well at this until the Ku Klux got so bad, us had to move back with Mr. Nelson for protection. The men's that took us in was Union men. They lived here in the South but they took in us part in the slave business. The Ku Klux threat to whoop Mr. Nelson case he took up fair de niggers. Heap UV nights we would hear of the Ku Klux comin' and leave home. Sometimes us was scared not to go and scared to go away from home. One day I borrowed a gun from Ed Davis to go school huntin'. When I taken the gun back I didn't unload hit lack I alus been doin'. That night the Ku Klux called on Ed to whoop him. When they told him to open the do, he heard one of them say, shoot him time he gets the do open. Well, he says to M, wait twell I kin light the lamp. Then he got the gun what I had left loaded, got down on his knees and stuck hit th of a log and pulled the trigger. He hit Newt Dobbs in the stomach and killed him. He couldn't stay rune Burleson any mo, so he come to Mr. Nelson and got enough money to get to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. The Ku Klux got bad show enough den and went to killin niggers and white folks, too. I'm I.E.D. Kesey Drumgool. Reverend W.C. Northcross performed the ceremony. 
Dear warn't nobody dear but the witness and me and Keezy. I had three sons, but all of them is dead, seepin one and dat's you. He get seven chillins. He wooks on the relief. Abe Lincoln was as nobler man as ever walked. Jeff Davis was as smart man as you ever want to see. In during the war he sheared his horse in such a way that he looked like he was going one way when he'd gwined the other. Booker T. Washington did one of the greets things when he fix it for nigger boys and girls to learn how to get on in the world. Slavery wouldn't have been so bad, but folks made it so by selling us for high prices, and of coesy folks had to try to get day money's worth out of M. The chillin' of his A.E.L. was in bondage one time and God sent Moses to liver M. Well I suppose that God sent Abe Lincoln to liver us. Interview with Abe Whitus. David Holt. Mayor of Douglasville. When the sunshine is warm, Abe Whitus, mayor of Douglasville, sits outside his cabin door near Bay Minette, Alabama and watches the stream of traffic on US 31 just beyond his bare feet, resting in the soothing sand. More than 90 years ago he was born and not many miles from this same cabin over in Mississippi as a slave of Colonel Rupert, who owned plantations in Alabama and Mississippi. I come over to Alabama after the surrender, Abe Whitus told his interviewer after he had retired with dignity to put on shoes before he permitted his photograph to be taken. I went to a plantation in Butler County Fust and then came on down here to Bay Minette. Slavery wasn't so bad. Colonel Rupert was a good marster, but he lived way over in Mobile and thus was at his Scooby, Scuba, plantation. That was in Kemper County and his overseer there show was handy with a whoop. I was a cotton hand and spent most of my time totten water for the other hands. When Mr. Lincoln emancipated us we was free and I didn't carry any more water. It wasn't twelve after the surrender I went to Butler County, where Colonel Rupert had him another plantation. I come down here to Bay Minette a long time ago. I asked to be chairman of the Republican Party in Baldwin County here, but when the Republicans got in they made the white gemmon what took my job postmaster. Then the bank I had my money in went busted in another Republican time and I loses $658.05. I votes for Mr. Roosevelt now. Abe Whitus stopped to take a chew of his favorite tobacco and admitted that he lived alone in his one-room cabin by preference. He doesn't want women both Aaron round his place and ain't had no truckin' with M for years. He cooks on the hearth just as his mammy did before him decades ago in the slave quarters of Colonel Rupert's plantation. Abe Whitus, Bay Minette, Alabama. Despite his years, he is well able to take care of himself. He carries his nine decades lightly, and his kindly face is topped by a wealth of snow-white hair. Though he lost money in the bank failure that made him a Democrat in politics, Abe owns fourteen acres of land, part of which he farms. He has cleared a portion of it for a baseball diamond which is rented to Negro teams, who play there frequently. The fee is always collected before a ball is thrown. Several years ago he donated a part of the acreage to be used for a public road which opened up a portion of Douglasville, the suburb in which he lives, where a number of Negroes had developed a residential section. His people named him then and since, Mayor of Douglasville, without office or emolument, but Abe wears the title with a dignified content for his remaining years. Interview with Callie Williams. Mary A. Poole, Mobile. Paterollers used shackles, says Callie. Callie Williams was only four years old at the time of the surrender, but stories told to her by her mother are vividly remembered. And the fact that she has had the same environment continuously throughout the years imprinted these happenings permanently on her mind. She lives at 504, Eslava Street, Mobile. My mammy and pappy was brought to Alabama by speculators who sold M to Mr. Hiram McLemore at Newport Landing, on the Alabama River, Callie said. Mammy's name was Vicey and she was born in Virginia, but my pappy was born in Kentucky. His name was Harry. Mr. McLemore had about 300 head of slaves, some of them on one plantation of about 2,000 acres and de res on another place of about 500 acres. He show did have a pretty house. 
It was all white and ramblin' like and had big trees around it. Deer was a cool well and a big dairy right close by it and den the cabins was all in a row in the back, some of em made out of planks, but mo's of em was made with logs. Day was all named after whoever lived in em. Aunt Callie needed little urging to tell of the old days, and she claims to vividly remember her master's family. His wife was named Axie Bethia and he had seven children, she said. One of them I never will forget, Miss Julia, case she gimme the first calico dress I ever had and I was proud as a peacock with it. Miss Julia was the oldest little girl and day give me to her. My mammy say dat day waked up in the morning when day heard the sweep. Dat was a piece of iron hangin by a string and it made a loud noise when it was banged with another piece of iron. Day had to get up at four o'clock and be at work by sunup. To do this, Day mows all the time cook breakfast the night befo. Happy was a driver under the overseer, but Mammy say dat she stay at the little nursery cabin and look after all the little babies. Day had a cabin fixed up with homemade cradles and things where Day put all the babies. Der mammies would come in from the field about ten o'clock to nurse em and den later in the day, my mammy would feed the youngest on pot liquor and the older ones on greens and pot liquor. They had skimmed milk and mush, too, and all of them stayed as fat as a butterballs, me among em. Mammy saw dat I always got my share. The slaves got rations every Monday night. Deer would be three pounds of meat and a peck of meal. Deer was a big garden that all of them worked and they had all the vegetables they needed and deer was always plenty of skimmed milk. They cooked the meals on open fireplaces in the big iron spiders. Dem was big pots hangin' over the fire from a hook. They do the cookin' at night and then warm it over the next day if they wanted it that way. While Mammy was tendin' the baby she had to spin cotton and she was supposed to spin two cuts a day. For, cuts, was a hard day's work. What was a cut? You oughta, know dat. Day had a reel and when it had spun three hundred yards it popped. Dat was a, cut. When it had been spun, then another woman took it to the loom to make cloth for the slaves. Day always took Saturday afternoon to clean up the clothes and cabins, case Day always had to start work on Monday morning, clean as a pin. If Day didn't, they got whooped for being dirty. Some of the niggers, after they'd been beat, would try to run away and some of them got loose. But the patterollers caught a lot of them and then they'd get it harder than ever befo, and have shackles out on deer feet with just enough slack for them to walk so they could work. If they wanted to go possum hunting or fishing, they could get passes from the overseer. Two things they really loved to eat was possum and fish. They'd eat and eat, till they'd get sick and then they'd have to boil up a dose of boneset tea to work em out. If dat didn't make em feel better, they'd go to Mars Tur. He always kept calomel, blue moss and quinine on hand. If they got too bad off sick, then Mars Tur would call the doctor. The children wasn't bothered with nothing much but worms and they'd take Jerusalem oak. It was the seed of a weed dat cook and mix glasses to make it taste like candy. Boneset was a bush and they'd boil the leaves to get boneset tea. Most of the time the slaves would be too tired to do anything but go to bed at night, but sometimes they would sit around and sing after supper and they would sing and pray on Sunday. One of the songs dat was used most was, Yon Comes Old Mars Ter Jesus. If I remembers rightly, it went sampen like this. I really believe Christ is comin' again. He's comin' in the mornin'. He's comin' in the mornin'. He's comin' with a rainbow on his shoulder. He's comin' again by and by. Day tried to make em stop singin' and prayin' during the war, case all day'd ask for was to be sought free, but the slaves would get in the cabins and turn a big wash pot upside down and sing into dat, and the noise couldn't get out. I don't remember nothing about this septin what Mammy say. When the surrender come, she say dat a whole regiment of soldiers rode up to the house yellin' to the niggers that day was free. 
Then the soldiers took the meat out of the smokehouse and got all the flasses and meal and give it all to the niggers. They rob the bees and then they eat dinner and go on to the next place, tucking the menfolks with them, all, septin, the ones too old, my pappy among em. After it was all over my pappy rented land on Mr. Macklemore's place and he and Mammy stayed dear till they died. They was buried in the same graveyard that Mr. Macklemore had set aside for his slaves. I married Frank Williams in Montgomery, Alabama, but our marriage was nothing like Mammy say her and Pappy's was. She say they jumped the broomstick. When any of the slaves wanted to get married they would go to the big house and tell Mars to and he'd get his broomstick and say, Harry, does you want vicey? And Harry would say, yes. Then Marster would say, Vicey, does you want Harry? And she say, yes. Then Marster say, Jine hands and jump the broomstick and you is married. The ceremony wasn't much but they stuck lots closer then, and you didn't hear about so many divorces and such as that. All my children is dead but two. I had five. One is living in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I live here with the other one. I, specs I'll just go on livin', here, till I die, serving old Mars to as best I can. If all the peoples on this here earth would do that, we wouldn't be pestered with all these here troubles like we is nowadays. Interview with Sylvia Witherspoon Susie R. O'Brien, Uniontown, Alabama Foots gets tired from choppin' cotton. Aunt Sylvia Witherspoon sat dozing on the steps of her small cabin, her bare feet stretched out in the dry dust of the yard. A large horsefly settled upon her broad nose and after a moment Aunt Sylvia's composure was disturbed to such an extent that she waved it off with her hand. On doing so her eyes opened and she saw me approaching the steps. She straightened. Monine, misties. Just set tin, he a coolin' off my foots. I.S.E. plum wa out f'um choppin cotton. Yes ma'am, she continued, after I had asked a few questions, I remember some things, about the slavery days. Coesi I can't remember just exactly how old I is, but I muse be mot nigh on to ninety, C.A.S.E. I was a wrought sizable gal when the war ended. I was bound on a plantation in Jackson, Mississippi, that belonged to my massa, Dr. Minto Witherspoon. My pappy and mammy was named Lumman Phyllis Witherspoon. The white folks lived in a big, white house made out in logs. Honey, Massa and Misty's Witherspoon was quality. Yes ma'am, they was quality. Us slaves was treated lack we was sompen round dat place. Massa didn't low no overseer to tote no strop hind his niggers. Besides dat we was fed good and had good clothes. He you see the done had brogan sont out in boxfuls f a mobile. My job was to do little things around the white folks house, but beefo that I stayed in the quarters and nussed my mammy's chillins, while she worked in the fiels. She would tie the smallest baby on my back so's I could play without no inconvenience. I laked to stay at the big house, though, and fan the flies often the white folks while they eaty. That was the best job I eber had. Misty's give me a dress dat de white chillins done out growed and on Sunday I was the dressed upest nigger in the quarter. Massa longed to the Presbyterian Chu C.H., so all us niggers was Presbyterians too. We all went to our own Chu C.H. dat was on the play star. Massa kept a pack of bloodhounds but it warn't often dat he had to use M.C.A.S.E. none of our niggers eber runned away. One day, though, a nigger named Joe did run away. Believe me misties, dem bloodhounds cotch dat nigger, F.O., he got to the creek good. It makes me laugh till yit de way dat nigger jumped in the creek when he couldn't swim a lick just C.A.S.E. dem hounds was atter him. He show made a splash, but they managed to get him out, F.O. he drowned. I ma ed about a year atter de war, and misties, I didn't have no pretty dress to get ma ed in. I ma ed dat old nigger in a dirty work dress and my feets was bare just like day is now. I figured dat if and he loved me, he loved me just as well in my bare feets as he would with my shoes on. Does I believe in ghosties? Show I does. 
I don't suppose you was bound with a veil on yo, face lack I was, C-A-S-E I can see dem ghosties as plain as day was here right now. I'll tell you, bout one dat comes out de white folks choose each yard. On dark rainy nights, I sees him, tall with long white robes drapping f on him. He carries a big light so bright dat you can't see his face, but he looks just like a man. It don't bother me none, C-A-S-E I don't bother it. I keeps a flower sifter and a fork by my bed to keep de witches f em riding to me. How come I knows day rides me? Honey, I be so tired in the morning, I can scarcely get out in my bed, and it's all on account of dem which is riding me, so I put the sifter dear to cotch em. Sometimes I wears dis dime with de hole in it around my ankle to keep off de conjure, but since Monroe King Tuckin died us ain't had much conjuring rune here. You know dat old nigger would put a conjure on somebody for just a little sum of money. He sold conjure bags to keep de sickness away. He could conjure the grass and the birds and anything he wanted to. The niggers rune you see to give him chickens and things so's he wouldn't conjure em, but it's a funny thing misties, I ain't never understood it, he got tuck off to jail for stealin' a mule. And us niggers waited rune many a day for him to conjure himself out, but he never did. I guess he just didn't have quite enough conjuring material to get hisself thuf dat stone wall. I ain't never understood it, though. Interview with George Young Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama Peter had no keys, seepin hsn. The Lord Wooden trusted Peter with no keys to heaven, in the opinion of George Young, of Livingston, Alabama. Born into slavery 91 years ago. George knew the rigors of slavery under an absentee landlord and brutal overseers, according to the story he tells. I was born on what was known as the Chapman Place, five miles norwest of Livingston, on August 10, 1846, George began his tale. My name was George Chapman and I had five brothers, Anderson, Harrison, William, Henry and Sam, and three sisters, Phoebe, Francis, and Amelia. My mother's name was Marion Chapman and my father's name was Sam Young, but he belonged to Mr. Chapman. Us all belonged to Governor Reuben Chapman of Alabama. The overseer's name was Mr. John Smith, and another's name was Mr. Lawler. He was dear the year I was born, and they called hit Lawler year. Both of them was mean, but Lawler, I hear tell, was de means. They had over three hun slaves, K's day had three plantations, one at Bodk, one in Huntsville and this year one. I can't say Marcia Chapman wasn't good to us, K's he was all the time in Huntsville and just come now and then and bring his family to see Bowden things. But the overseers was show mean. I seed slaves plenty times with iron bands, rune, day ankles and a hole in the band, and a iron rod fastened to hit what went up the outside of day leg to the waist and fastened to another iron band, rune, the waist. This year was to keep em from bending day legs and running away. Day called hit puttin' the stiff knee on you, and hit show made em stiff. Sometimes hit made em sick, too. K's day had dem iron bands so tight rune de ankles, that when day tuck em off live things was under em, and dat's what give em fever, they say. Us had to go out in de woods and get mayapple root and mullen wheat and all sitch to bile for to sire de fever. Miss, war was de lord in dem days. What was he doin? But some of em runned away, anyhow. My brother Harrison was one, and they sought the nigger dogs on him like foxhounds run a fox today. They didn't run him down till bout night but finally they cotched him, and the hunters fetched him to the do and say, Mary Ann, here Harrison. Then they turned the dogs loose on him ag in, and sich a screamin' you never hired. He was all bloody and mammy was a hollerin', save him, Lord, save my chili, and Don, let dem dogs eat him up. Mr. Lawler said, the Lord ain't got nothin' do with dis here, and hit show look like he didn't, case dem dogs nigh, bout chewed Harrison up. Dem was hard times, show. They didn't alarn us nothin' and didn't low us to alarn nothin'. 
If and they catch us alarnin to read and write, they cut us hon off. They didn't low us to go to church, neither. Sometimes a slip off and have a little prayer meetin' by us EVS in a old house with a dirt flow. They'd get happy and shoutin' couldn't nobody hire em, case they didn't make no fuss on the dirt flow, and one stand in the do and watch. Some folks put they head in the wash pot to pray, and pray easy, and somebody be watchin' for the overseer. Us get whooped fair everything if and hit was public node. Us wasn't load visit nobody from place to place, and I see Jim Dawson, this here same Iverson Dawson, daddy, I seed him stobbed out with F.O. stobs. They laid him down on his belly and stretch his hands out on both sides and tie one to one stob, and one to the other. Both his feet was stretch out and tied to dem stobs. Then they whooped him with a whole board what you kiver a house with. The darkies had to go deer in the night and take him up in a sheet and carry him home, but he didn't die. He was cuzzed of gwine over to the neighbor's plantation at night. Nine o'clock was the loss hour us had to be closed in. Head man come out and holler, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everybody in and do's locked. And if in you want, you got whooped. Want nobody load to coat. Us just taken up together and go ahead, and that thing want fixed, twell adders render. The patterols come from different tea places, and the tank slays, the pots, the cockels and the gregris was neighbors. I may have went to day house and day claim to pertec me playin' with day little nigger chillin', but if and the patterolers catch me, they claim they want sponsible. One day, they tuck out at me and I come right here in Livingston, but I was gwine to run away anyhow, case I had seed ol' Uncle Thornton that mornin'. See, I was the CAF nusser and soon as I left the house I met him, and here come the overseer, Mr. Smith. He sent at me and he said, I seed six niggers in the woods what run away, and asked did I see ol' man Thornton. I said, no, I ain't seed nobody. He said, nev mine, I make you tell a better tale and dat in the morning, dot. So when I went with the slop to dem CAVS I got to thinkin' bout dat whooping so I come right here. Mr. Norville had a wood shop right, cross the road dear by the white folks Baptist church and I hid in the back of hit dat night. But they found me and tuck me back. Then they stopped me from CAF Nussin and put me in the fiel under the head man. I was glad of dat, case I wanted to be with the other Hans, but when I found out how twas, I wanted to be back. Hit was a harder toss den when I was nussin, CAVS and keepin em from breakin in the fiel and eatin up the crop. I was a good Han and obeyed the owners and the head man and never had no fuse bout work. I went one time to Bennett Station, ten miles below here, with just seven mo niggers from the Chapman place, and us drive over a thou san head of cattle to Atlanta, Georgia, and never had no trouble. I was easy pleased. Give me a piece of candy and I'd lick hit twelve my mouth was so. I reckon hit was all right, but I dunno. All the nations couldn't rule. Just lack hit is now, the strong's people muse rule. George Young, Livingston, Alabama. Adder surrender, they tuck a darky for the private judge, but dat nigger didn't know nothin' and he couldn't rule. So den they tuck a white man named Sanders, and he done all right. We was under hard taskmasters and I'm glad they sought me free, case I was under burden and bound. But ignorancy can't rule, hit show can't. We is darkies, and white folks ought to be favorable. Some speaks better words than others, but everybody ain't got the same heart, and that's all I knows. No em, I dunno nothin' bout no spirits either, but Christ peered to the apostles, didn't he, adder he been dead? And ise seed folks done been dead jess as notchell in the day as you is now. One day me and my wife was pickin' cotton right out yonder on Mr. White's place, and I looked up and seed a man all dressed in black with a white shirt bosom, his hat a sitten on one side, riding a black hoss. I stooped down to pick some cotton, then look up and he was gone. I said to my wife, 
I call her Glover but she go by two names, I said, Glover, wonder war dat man went what was ridin' long yonder on dat passin' hoss. She say, what passin' hoss and what man? I said, he was comin' down dat bank by dat ditch. Day ain't no bridge dear, and no hoss could jump hit. Glover said, well, I'm gwine in the house, case I don, feel like pickin' cotton today. But I ain't scared of M. I gets out the path plenty times to let M by, and if and you can see M, walk rune M. If and you can't see M, den they'll walk rune you. If and day gets too plentiful, I jes hangs a hoss shoe upside down over the dew, and don, have no mo trouble. But everybody otter have dat kinder men, to honor God. He peered to the disciples adder he died, and he said also, Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. But Peter didn't have nobody's keys, sep in his en. Don't you know if and he'd have give Peter all dem keys, days a heap of folks Peter Gwinnitter keep out of dear Jess for spite. God ain't Gwinnitter do nothing dat foolish. Peter didn't have nobody's key, seep in Peter's. Transcriber's Note Original spelling has been maintained, e.g., stob, a short straight piece of wood, such as a stake, American Heritage Dictionary. The Works Progress Administration was renamed during 1939 as the Work Projects Administration, WPA.